<clears throat> Any questions before we get rolling today? Yeah, I have a good question. Okay. Um, the uh, muscle activity handout that's being graded. Yes. Uh, where can I find that? Because I was looking under module and I was looking under other stuff, but I don't see the instructions or what we're supposed to do. Uh, hold on. It should be in the module, but let's uh, let's find out. Because I do see the title, but when I click on it, it just says, you know, it gives me the option to submit papers, but no instructions. Right, well, because that's where you submit the assignment, yes. Right, right, right. The only thing I would say on this is obviously this is an assignment you've had for a long time. If you weren't able to find it, you might have wanted to ask more than a day before it was due. Yeah, I know. But um, here. So again, as always, under the course modules, uh, muscular system section three, under the lab handouts is where you'll find the muscle. Oh, not sure what's going on there. Muscle activity handout. And as you can see, the muscle activity handout has two uh, portions. The first part, like we talked about, I give you an activity, I describe that activity, you tell me the muscle, what the actual actions are. And the second part is I've given you the muscle and the actions, and then you have to tell me the activity that you would use that for. So it's basically the exact same thing we've been doing in our lab portion that everybody's been demonstrating. So it's just a way of, again, uh, making this a more interactive type of activity. So yeah, it's there under the lab handouts, muscle like um, Okay, got you, yep. thank you. Yep. Any other questions before we get started? All right, excellent, let's talk game plan then. Uh, same as it ever was, uh, muscle physiology and lecture, origins, insertions, and actions in lab. Uh, we've gotten through uh, some of our arms, uh, the, the muscles of our arm. We have to finish our arm and hopefully start the leg today. So that will be our game plan for that. Two more assignments due. Your last unit review, 11, is due for this section. And then also that muscle activity handout we just looked at, also due. And again, as mentioned, will be graded for correctness. And then uh, all leading up to Thursday. So you have one more day off to study, uh, an open lab on Wednesday, which you can take advantage of. Uh, and then the lab and lecture exam is on Thursday. As I mentioned, the lab exam is a little bit longer. Uh, so I've cut out a couple of the multiple choice questions on the lecture exam and shortened the time for that uh, so that everything can still be completed within the time necessary uh, in the classroom. And then Friday, we uh, get to, uh, even though you'll be hungover from the exam, uh, we will be starting the nervous system. So uh, again, our fourth and final component. And again, not only do we have our, our uh, uh, nervous system to worry about, but we also then have that cumulative final exam to worry about as well. So we've got a busy last three weeks of the class. All righty. Any questions on any of that? All right, then excellent. So let's dive back into lecture. Up to this point, we have been talking about uh, first taking a single muscle, like the bicep brachia, baking it down to its most basic components, those proteins, and then we built them up into a sarcomere, and we saw how that sarcomere functioned, and then we talked about the effect that has on the whole myofibril, and we talked about the effect it has on the whole muscle cell, and then we talked about ways that we can change tension in a single muscle cell. But as I mentioned, if I'm lifting up my cup of coffee, or if I'm lifting up a textbook, or if I'm lifting up a chair, I need to be able to produce different amounts of tension. And we talked about how we could produce different amounts of tension within a single muscle cell. But if I'm gonna lift up a cup of coffee, I don't half fire just one muscle cell. And if I'm gonna lift up a textbook, I fire the entire muscle cell. The advantage that I have is that I can use, and for this, let's actually start with the whiteboard. Uh, when I lift things, objects through space, I don't rely on just one single muscle cell. Instead, I rely on what are known as motor units. 
a motor unit is, I need a little room to be able to write this out, a somatic motor neuron and all of the muscle cells. And let's be, well, since we're still talking about skeletal, let's be specific. Muscle cells, it connects to. All right, so there's a couple important thing, pieces of information to know about motor units. On average, one somatic motor uh, neuron communicates with, I don't know, 150 muscle cells. <clears throat> Of course, the key word there is average. That's like saying the average height for a male is five foot 10, right? That is a number. It is an average across the entire surface of the planet. But if you grab 10 men off the surface of the planet right now, would they all be exactly five foot 10 inches tall? These are the easy questions. No, of course not. There is a wide range. And the same thing is true here. Uh, there can be ranges with one somatic motor neuron that communicates to just three or four muscle cells, uh, allowing for tremendous precision. We were talking about that threading of the needle where you have tr tr uh, very dexterous or precise uh, types of actions. There are other somatic motor neurons that can communicate to thousands of muscle cells. So one somatic motor neuron communicates with thousands of muscle cells. Right? It's kind of like the army. Right. A uh, general controls thousands of soldiers, but each soldier just gets commands from one general. And that's kind of what we've got going on here. Obviously, if you've got thousands of muscle cells all connected to one somatic motor neuron, that's not going to give you a lot of precision, but it's going to give you a tremendous amount of power and strength for jumping or kicking or punching or things along those lines. Because that's the other key to a motor unit. The other key component of the motor unit is that. Uh, all when, let's say it this way, when the somatic motor neuron, I'm going to abbreviate this way, fires an action potential, all the muscle cells uh, contract and relax together. So when one fires, all fires, right? We can draw some really simple examples of this. Let's start by putting, um, oh, I don't know, let's say six muscle cells. And pretend that those were all the same size. Six muscle cells there, excellent. And then we need a neuron. Let's start with a red one first. Move this out of my way. You can go there. Excellent. So here is my first motor neuron. We will call this motor neuron A. Again, we've talked a little bit about the anatomy of our neurons. We know they have dendrites where they receive the information, small little branching branches, and then one single axon that comes off. We know that axon allows it to go and communicate where we have a synaptic end bulb. And that synaptic end bulb, of course, sits on the motor end plate of our muscle cell. All right. However, as we also mentioned, and so let's do a second one here. And we'll of course then call this one B. it has an axon that comes off. But remember, as we mentioned, that axon can branch. So it, when it branches into those axon terminals, 
it allows for the opportunity for it to communicate with more than one muscle cell. So in this case, it can communicate with that muscle cell, and uh, we can say it communicates with this muscle cell. And of course, then we need a third somatic motor neuron. with its dendrites. With its axon. And with its axon terminals that allow it to form not one, in this case, not two, in this case, but three neuromuscular junctions. And again, notice the key to this. Each muscle cell only has one neuromuscular junction. Each muscle cell receives input from one and only one motor neuron, right? And so of course this third one B, I mean the third one blue, we have to name. And since it's the third one, uh, we will of course call it number three. Nah, I'm kidding, we'll call it C. All right, excellent. So this is a really simple basic anatomy. These are six muscle cells that would all be, for instance, in a fascicle. So do that and do that. And, oops, so I spelled muscle right. Three, six muscle cells in a fascicle. And let's say that this was a really simple muscle in my arm that only had one fascicle in it. Again, I'd appreciate that this isn't realistic, but you get the point. And because we're gonna use simple, stupid, and simple numbers, let's say I needed to lift a single pen. And the weight of a pen only required one single muscle cell to be able to lift it. So when I have my arm in its extended position, and I decide to lift this pen up with this muscle in my arm, which motor unit would I use, A, B, or C? A. A, I would use A, exactly. A is the one that I would use to lift it. If I needed to lift two pens, which motor unit would I use then? B, exactly. If I wanted to lift three pens, what would I do? C. Is there anything else I could do to lift three pens? A and B. A and B together, exactly. Right, that's the other thing. We can fire motor units together. That's helpful if I wanted to lift four. If I wanted to lift four, what would I do then? A and C. A and C. If I wanted to lift five pens, what would I do? D and C. There you go. If I wanted to lift six pens, what would I do? A, B, and C. And if I wanted to lift seven pens? You wouldn't be able to do it. I'm screwed, exactly, I couldn't, right? Because I'm at the limit now of what I'm able to produce as far as force goes from this particular muscle. At that point, maybe I could use another muscle or something like that to be able to do it. There you go. Notice in this, we have really talked about not one, but two concepts. Right. Notice we can use different size motor units to be able to produce different amounts of tension. And notice also as the tension built, I couldn't rely on just one motor unit anymore. Instead, what I needed to be able to do is actually recruit, and that's the key magical term we're going to use, recruit multiple motor units to work together. And as they work together, I was able to generate more and more force. Of course, is there a maximum to the amount of force I'm able to produce? Yes, absolutely. I'm limited by how many muscle cells I have and how much force they can generate. So there is a maximum to the tension that I can produce. But what I have is I have two concepts here. I have different size motor units that can produce different amounts of tension and I can recruit them. I can add motor units together to produce more and more tension as necessary. 
Let's look at the pretty picture from the textbook that shows these same things, these same concepts. If you don't like my drawing, here is the pretty picture from your textbook giving an example of this. Notice they pulled out a fascicle here out of a muscle. Uh, and so here's the fascicle, here are the muscle cells. And here are our multipolar uh, somatic motor neurons with their axons coming out, forming neuromuscular junctions. And again, notice each muscle cell gets one and only one neuromuscular junction. But a motor unit can talk to many muscle cells. And again, remember the advantage of this is we get the cells to work together. When that single neuron fires, all of the muscle cells that it communicates with all are going to contract and relax at the same time. As I mentioned, motor units on average are about 150 muscle cells, but that average isn't really meaningful. It's almost like the averages on our exams. There are some way at one end, some way at other end, and the average is just a mathematical number in between. Some motor units allow for precise activity, like threading that needle. They a single muscle, a motor neuron communicates with just a handful of cells, right? When only five muscle cells fire together, you're not producing a lot of tension. But what you are getting is very small, very precise, very dexterous movements. However, when you want to kick that, oops, wrong direction, when you want to kick that 50-yard field goal to win the game at an overtime, for that, you need coordination of large numbers, hundreds and thousands of muscle cells working together that aren't going to give you the same type of precision, but give you a massive amount of power. All right. Oops, wrong direction again. Like the illustration that I drew, here you see also that typically these motor units are intermingled within themselves. So here, notice we have three motor units, just like I had. And just like we had in our fascicle, it isn't just like all the muscle cells on one side are by one and all the muscle cells on the other by another and the ones in the middle are a third. They're intermixed with each other. And the advantage of that is that you get the same type of action. If just all the muscles on one side of a fascicle were communicated to a neuron, then just that side of the fascicle would move and you'd get a weird bending to the fascicle. Whereas if you had the same thing on the other side, so when one motor unit fired, the fascicle would go that way. When the other uh, motor unit fired, the fascicle would go that way. And you wouldn't get the same type of actions. By having them intermingled, all of the motor units do the exact same action, but they can produce different amounts of tension. Now notice there is something interesting about this particular motor unit, Not or this particular fascicle. If you look at the motor units, <clears throat> unlike mine, where one had one and one had two and one had three, if you notice, they all have about the same number of muscle cells. So all of these individually are gonna produce about the same amount of strength. And we'll talk about why it's useful to have similar size fascicles, I mean, similar size motor units as well in just a minute. But as I mentioned, the other big concept that we talked about with the illustration is this concept of recruitment. Recruitment allows you to get more and more motor units to work together. And when you have more motor units working together, right, the more motor units, where's my annotation? There it is. More motor units working together, the more muscle cells that are firing together, and the more muscle cells that are firing together, the more tension you're gonna produce. So there's a huge advantage to being able to get more and more muscle cells to work together. Notice that's here what we see in this illustration shown here at the bottom. Let me switch to my highlighter. Notice here we have a fascicle, right? We only send a no signal to it and there's no tension that is being produced. <clears throat> here we fire our first fascicle, I mean our first motor unit. And that first motor unit in the fascicle only can, communicates with two muscle cells. So we produce a small amount of tension. But then we recruit the next one that has three in it. And then that increases it. And then the next motor unit and the next motor unit until we have recruited all of the motor units that are communicating with that fascicle. At that point, like when I was lifting those six pens, when all the muscle cells are firing together, that's obviously the maximum amount of tension you're able to produce by that fascicle, right? You've recruited everything that can be recruited and that is now um, 
the maximal tension you can produce. Now, one of the interesting things about our motor units is we have these motor units, but motor units don't all get excited at the same rate. The smallest motor units are the ones that are stimulated first. Those are the ones that are easiest to excite. So as we used that example before, motor unit A, controlling just one muscle cell, actually can get excited first. So it gets stimulated first, and if that's not enough to lift the weight, then we add the second, and if that's not enough to lift the weight, we add the third. So in this way, we start with our smallest muscle units, our smallest, smallest I was going to say, smallest motor units, and from there, we keep adding bigger and bigger until we produce enough tension to move what we need to move through space or till we max it out. All right. Now, <clears throat> if we go back to the previous picture, notice in this one, they're all about the same size. So they're all about um, the same strength. And so they're going to produce about the same amount of tension. What would be the advantage of having similar size motor units like this? I mean, everything we've talked about makes perfect sense, but then why have motor units that are the same size? Everybody's asleep. All right, well, let me, give you, let me give you back. Part of it would be greater tension, but it's more than that as well. Let's think of it this way. Let's go back to my elementary school when I had to hold my hands out and hold those textbooks in my arms until my principal got tired. If I was holding my arms out using this fascicle, would it be efficient for me to just keep trying to hold that textbook up just using the red motor unit and I just keep firing that red motor unit again and 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 again, holding that book up with just the red motor unit in this case? Would that be an efficient way to try to keep that book up for as long as possible? No, why not? What's gonna happen to those red muscle cells if I keep firing them over and over and over and over and over again? Uh, you'll fatigue. They're gonna fatigue, exactly. If I just rely on the red motor unit, then what's gonna happen is they're gonna fatigue and probably fatigue very quickly and my arm's gonna go down. However, if I'm able to switch back and forth between them, first fire the red, then fire the blue, then fire the purple, then fire the red again, then the blue, then the purple. If I'm able to fire through them asynchronously, where they're not all firing at the same time, then notice what I'm able to do is with each one, I'm able to fire those muscle cells and let them relax and then fire those muscle cells and let them relax. And by doing it asynchronously offset with the other ones, what I'm able to do is produce a relatively high level of tension that I can maintain for a prolonged period of time. So it allows me to maintain that activity for a longer period of time. Right, not long enough necessarily till the principal got tired. Right, he always got, I always got tired before he did, but I was able to hold it up a lot longer than I would have been able to do if I was just relying on one motor unit. So, the other advantage of recruitment, the other advantage of having these motor units is that I can fire them asynchronously, and that allows me to sustain an activity for a longer period of time without fatigue. We're gonna talk about fatigue. We've already talked about fatigue a couple times. We're gonna talk about fatigue even more today. But yeah, that's our goal, to be able to contain, continue that muscle activity for as long as possible, to stave off that fatigue. And so firing these motor units asynchronously would allow us to be able to do that. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Now, as I mentioned, we fire these muscles to produce tension, right? That force. And typically, our goal our goal when producing muscle contractions is to produce force. Oh, thank you. Ah, I forgot to those. Thanks. Oh, they're all dirty. Is to generate a force. There we go. 
Excellent. So we produce muscle contractions to generate a force. Typically, we are producing that force to offset some type of, to do work. Let's say it this way, to, to do work. And typically, from a physics standpoint, if we are producing a force to do work, that is to relate that force to a load, right? This pen is a load. And if my goal is to lift this pen up, I have to generate a force that is going to oppose this load, right? We want to oppose the load. to be able to move it through space. So when we're generating tension, we're producing a force, we're producing that tension, and it is to oppose a load, right? I know this is getting us into physics, but physics is a really good science, it's important, it's fun, uh, and so these are important things to uh, understand. So again, I misspelled producing, oops, still misproducing, uh, force to do work, all right? Excellent. So we have, if with that understanding, then what we can do is talk about uh, how that actually works in practicality. As I mentioned, while you're sitting here calmly in your well class, um, if you were to poke or laying in bed, whatever it is that you're doing while you're doing this, if you were to poke your legs, most of you, I'm guessing, aren't standing or on the treadmill walking in place. Although that'd be a really cool way to take the class. Uh, take sitting and walk down on a treadmill, but I'm assuming most of you probably aren't doing that. Uh, if you were to poke your leg while your leg is at rest right now, as we mentioned, you still have a bit of muscle tone in it. It feels different from that individual whose legs are paralyzed because there is that muscle tone, a partial contraction in what we call a relaxed muscle that helps to support the joint. It helps to uh, maintain blood flow, it, uh, you know, helping with the circulation, uh, uh, sustaining, protecting the organs inside, all of those things that we talked about. So many muscles are in a constant state of partial contraction, giving them that muscle tone. But typically when we think of a contraction, we think of the effect of moving that body through space. When we move the body through space, we call that an isotonic contraction. Now there is a lot in a name. Iso, oops, iso, what does iso mean? What does iso mean? Same, excellent. Iso means same. And in this case, tonic refers to the tone or the tension that needs to be produced, all right? Think of it this way. If my goal is to move this pen through space as I'm doing that contraction and lifting the pen, does the weight of the pen change when it's here versus when it's here versus when it's here versus when it was down here when I started? Anywhere along that path as I'm lifting it, does that pen's weight change? It's not a trick question. No, of course not. Absolutely. So what that means with an isotonic contraction is that the amount of force I need to move it is going to stay the same the whole time. So the key with an isotonic contraction is the force that is produced by the muscle stays the same during the whole contraction. So as I lift that pen, as I flex my elbow and lift this pen up, how much force I am generating from my muscle has to stay the same the whole time. So the tone, the tension is the same, all right? But notice the key with this, while the force that I'm producing stays the same, my muscle changes shape. Oops. my muscle changes shape. So notice if I'm lifting this pen, for instance, my bicep brachia is getting shorter. And the reason the muscle changes shape is really important. The reason, oops, 
the reason the muscle changes shape is because the force or the tension I generate is not equal to the load. Again, we're not gonna worry about what the units are, but let's say that it took 10 of something to move this, right? right? 10 Slutskys worth of force to, as what the load of the pen is. And if I put 10 Slutskys of force into it, it's not gonna go anywhere, right? So I have to put 11 into it to be able to move it through space. So the key with an isotonic contraction is threefold. The force you produce stays the same. The muscle changes length. And the reason for that, and again, really it should say length, not shape. Shape's the same thing, but let's be more specific. It changes length. And the reason the muscle changes length is because the tension generated is not equal to the load. All right, questions on that? If this doesn't make sense, it's only gonna get worse. So questions on this? All right, stunned silence means that we completely understand this, Dr. Slutsky, let's move on. Excellent. This is different and I'm going to cheat and steal some of the board space here by doing that so that I can write over it. Let's talk about an isometric contraction. Iso still means same. However, in this case, metric refers to length. So with an isometric contraction, guess what happens? Guess what stays the same with this type of contraction? The length of the muscle. Exactly. So in this case, what happens, it is the length of the muscle that stays the same. So in an isometric contraction, the length of the muscle stays the same. However, the tension produced by the muscle can change. Let's again talk about a really basic, simple, real life example, right? Back in ancient times, there were places called stores that you used to be able to go to and buy things, right? Now everybody gets stuff from Instacart and DoorDash, but in ancient times, you would go to the store and you'd come home with a bunch of bags. And I'm sure you, like me, would grab the bags out of your car and lift them up. And of course, I always carried all of my bags into the house with my arm fully out and extended because that's how everybody carries their groceries in from the house, right? Notice I have the load of the bags of groceries that I am holding on to, but my arm is no longer moving through space, right? Obviously, I had to use an isotonic contraction to bring it up here. But notice now I still have to keep tension in my arms. And as I keep tension in my arms, the length of the muscle stays the same. All right. But then my loving wife comes and puts three more bags on my arm. If she puts three more bags on my arm, does my arm go down as a result of that? No, because if she puts, if my arm goes down, then that means she won. I can't let that happen. She puts three more bags on my arm. And so what happens? I have to put more tension into my arm to keep the arm where it is, right? If I, the arm goes down, she wins. I can't let that happen. So she puts three more bags on there. And instead what happens is I increase the tension in my arm so that uh, it stays in the same location. My kids who love me, feel bad and they come and take two of the bags off, one of them each, because they're lazy, but they love me. And so now when they take those two bags off, does my arm go flying into space as a result of that? No, I decrease the amount of tension that is in my arm to again, always match the load. 
And that's the key with an isometric contraction. With an isometric contraction, the tension that is produced always equals the load. If the load changes, I have to change the tension to match it. As people add more bags or take bags away from my arm, I have to increase or decrease the tension uh, so that it can match. And again, nobody carries their groceries in like this, right? But there are plenty of examples of isometric contractions that people will do in times of, oh, I don't know, like a pandemic when you can't go to the gym anymore. So one of the things they'll do is they will push against themselves. And I can push with a lot of force or I can push with just a little bit of force. Or I can pull with a lot of force or just a little bit of force. Or instead, you can stand against a wall, right? No matter how much you push or how little you push, the wall's not going anywhere. All of those are examples of times where I am producing tension in my muscle. I am contracting that muscle, but the muscle isn't changing length. Those are our isometric contractions. So notice for both of these types of contractions, one part stays the same, one part changes. And, because, and the reason for this is the relationship of the force we're producing, the tension we're producing, to the load that we have to overcome. Now, let's go back and answer these two questions. Now that we have an idea of what, oops, no, right there. What types of contractions these are, when would we use isotonic contractions? What do we use isotonic contractions for? Yeah, exactly. Walking is a great example. Moving the body through space. Lifting those groceries is an example. Walking into the house is an example. Grabbing the handle of the door and opening it. All of those are examples of isotonic contractions. What do we use isometric contractions for? Standing, posture, absolutely. Posture is a huge one. We take this such for granted, right? You know, the chair out of the way. This ability to stand here, I don't know if you can see my face, but my eyes are closed, right? I'm standing here and I'm not wobbling, right? We take that for granted. This ability to maintain our posture, to just stand in place uh, is huge because what's happening, and I'll exaggerate this, is that for instance, I may slowly be starting to lean to one side. As I start to lean to one side, that muscle stretches out as a result of it. So I need to put a little bit of te more tension, either a little bit more tension on this side or a little less tension on this side to bring my body back in balance. And then I start to go this side and more tension here and less tension here. I'm constantly increasing and decreasing the tension of the muscles so that the muscles stay in the same length. It's an incredibly complicated process that we take for granted until we lose that ability. Right? I can stand here with my eyes closed because I've only had two vodkas this morning for breakfast and not the normal five. Right? If you start to have that fifth or sixth vodka, then suddenly the ability of your body to be able to maintain that appropriate tension becomes a lot more challenging. Right? So we have uh, these different types of contractions for different types of functions. All right, questions on that? All right, I got one more question for you. So let's go back to my example of carrying in my groceries. So step one, I reach into the uh, trunk of my car and I bring the groceries up out at length. What type of contraction would that have been? Excellent, it is an isotonic contraction, excellent. Uh, let's ask two more questions, because we've done it. What muscle did I use to do that? Based on what we've learned so far, any idea? Well, okay, let's go back one step easier. So, I'm bringing my arm out to the side. What type of action is that? 
lifting it up to this out to the side like that what type of action would that be that would be an abduction absolutely and what muscle have we identified and talked about that allows me to abduct the arm to move my arm laterally probably requires a big lateral muscle what big lateral muscle allows me to bring it out deltoid excellent so i use my deltoid muscle to abduct my arm and bring the groceries up that is an isotonic contraction I then hold the groceries at arm's length with my deltoid as I walk into the house. What type of action is that? Isometric contraction, excellent, right? I'm producing tension in there. My wife adds a bag, my kid takes a bag, so the tension can change, but my arm stays in the same location. Then I get to the table in the kitchen and I just relax my deltoid muscle and allow the groceries to fall to the table. Is that what you do? You just finally, oh, I'm finally here. Relax the muscle and just drop the groceries to the table? No, right? You lower the groceries slowly in a controlled fashion. Well, bringing my arm down like that would be an adduction. So what muscle am I contracting to lower those, those um, groceries to the table. Or let's take it to another example. I love this example because this is a great one and that's a good guess. Let's just miss Dorsey's a good guess. So, but this one's an easier one for you to do, all right? I love going to the gym back in ancient times when you could go to the gym because you'd see these guys, we talk about doing the curls for the girls and what would happen is they'd have these big, huge, massive amounts of weight and they'd work really hard to get the weight up. And as soon as they get the weight up, do they just relax the muscles and let, the, mu and let the, the weight go down? Well, there are people who do that, but is that what you're supposed to do? Are you supposed to just relax the muscles and let the arms go down, extend out just loosely in a relaxed state? No, you want to lower the weight slowly. All right, so I want you to do this, right? Uh, flexion of the arm is bicep brachia. Extension of the arm is the tricep brachia. So obviously, when you are pretending to lift that muscle, you can feel the tension in the bicep brachia. So if extending the arm is the tricep brachia, what I want you to do is pretend to lower that weight in a controlled fashion and feel your bicep and feel your tricep. Where do you actually feel the tension when you're lowering that weight in the controlled fashion? Where is the tension? Is it in the bicep brachia or is it in the tricep brachia? as you're lowering that. Where do you feel it? Come on, I've done it like 17 times. One of you guys got to at least do it once. Bicep? Yeah, you feel it in the bicep brachia. It's the bicep brachia that's actually doing it. So what's actually happening, when we have an isotonic contraction, notice we said it changes the length of the muscle. I didn't say that it made it shorter. Because when I'm, flex when I'm raising that weight, I am contracting the bicep brachia and the bicep brachia is getting shorter. But when I am lowering that bag of groceries or I'm lowering that weight, I'm still contracting my bicep brachia, but the bicep brachia is getting longer. And that's because with isotonic contractions, there are two different types of isotonic contractions. The first type of isotonic contraction is what is called a concentric contraction. This is like when you're lifting those groceries, when you're lifting this weight. In this case, the muscle gets shorter during the contraction. And the reason the muscle gets shorter is because the tension that you produce is greater than the load. So let's go back to simple examples. I have four pens in my hand. So it takes four muscle cells worth of tension to hold it up if I want to hold them stable. However, if I want to lift those four, I need to fire five so I'm producing more tension than the load and I can bring them up. So I fire five muscle cells to bring them up then I fire four muscle cells to hold those four pens in place. All right, so lifting them up, 
my muscle gets shorter as I do that because I'm producing more tension than the load. So that's lifting the groceries, lifting that weight. If though, I want to put these pens carefully on the table, because instead of pens, they're eggs, I don't want to just relax the muscle and let them fall. I want to control the descent. The way I would control the descent is by its four pens, maybe I only fire three muscle cells. Three muscle cells isn't gonna be enough to hold the weight up, so the weight's gonna pull my arm down, but it does it in more of a controlled fashion. I'm not just relaxing it and letting it fall. And that type of contraction is what we call, stop it, what we call, whoops, wrong direction, an eccentric contraction. With an eccentric contraction, the muscle lengthens during the contraction. You're contracting the muscle, but the length still gets longer. And the reason for this is the tension you produce is less than the load. And so lowering that weight, lowering the bag of groceries, right? Back in ancient times, you used to be able to get on a plane and travel. Got a nice big weekend coming up, right? We just had the 4th of July weekend, so one of the places you might want to go for the 4th of July is New York. There's no place is more American than New York City. And so while you're there, one of the things you may enjoy doing is going to the top of the Statue of Liberty. Right now, of course, nowadays, thanks to 9-11, you have to sign up uh, months in advance to get permission to go able to go up, get special tickets and all those kind of things. But in ancient times, you could decide to go to the Statue of Liberty and get to the top of the Statue of Liberty. The problem with getting to the top of the Statue of Liberty is that there's no elevator. It's stairs. Something like 3,762 or some crazy number like that, that you have to walk up and you have to walk down. And after walking up and down 3,652 uh, 3, stairs, how do you feel the next day? How do your legs feel the next day? Sore, especially your quadriceps. However, your quadriceps are actually sore, not from the going up, but from the coming down, right? If you think about what it's like to walk downstairs, and again, this is easier to demonstrate in the classroom, I'll try to cheat and do this. If you think about when you're walking downstairs, as you're walking down the stairs, you have tension in your quadricep muscles, but the quadricep muscles are actually elongating as you're walking down those stairs. So that is an example of an eccentric contraction. And the problem with eccentric contractions is they are more awkward for the muscle cell, right? They're more forceful uh, contractions, right? If you think about it, it doesn't make sense how the muscle cell could lengthen while it contracts because we've learned about the contractile cycle. The contractile cycle is myosin grabbing onto the actin, pulling on the actin, letting go, reaching out, grabbing and pulling. And it always pulls the Z disc and the actin towards the M line, so it always gets shorter. So how the heck can it get longer? Well, let's go back to the example of us playing, um, of us playing uh, tug of war. All of you on one side, all of me on the other. If you think about it, I'm going to be just like that myosin, grabbing the rope, pulling the rope, letting go, reaching out, grabbing the rope, pulling the rope, right? I'm going to be grabbing and pulling the rope just like those myosin heads. But if I'm on one side and all of you are on the other, am I going to be very successful at pulling the rope towards me? I may pull it for a brief period of time, but then you're gonna pull it back. You're either gonna pull it through my arm or you're gonna pull my arm back. If you think about it, as I grab and pull, you're gonna be jerking me away from that. And so notice in that elongation process, it's much more important, impactful, much more forceful, much more damaging for the muscle cell, which is what causes all of that soreness. So ironically, the soreness in your quadriceps is from coming down the stairs and not actually going up it. So in that fashion, we have these two different types of isotonic contractions, ones that shorten the muscle and ones that lengthen the muscle. And that's why when you're doing those curls for the girls, right, it's more impressive as you bring it up, but actually that controlled descent of the weight is actually much more impactful on the muscles for strengthening the muscles and building that muscle mass. 
So it's so much more important to do the entire range of motion and also to control it on its way down and not just do the impressive thing of hoisting it up uh, to your chest. All right. Questions on that? Like Jell, are you talking about my belly? Do you keep seeing them on there? Is that what that's about? All right. Any questions on our different types of contractions? All right. So now that we know the types of contractions we can make, the next thing we have to talk about is our metabolism, the energy for those contractions. How are we on time? Oh, we're actually doing good. Although, you know what? It's a little early, but this is a good natural stopping point. Let's go ahead and take our first break here. Uh, we'll take a 15 minute break, come back at 9.05, and at 9.05 we will restart here. Any questions on the types of contractions or motor units before we take our break? All righty, excellent. Then let's go ahead and take our first break now and I'll meet you back here in 15 minutes. All right, any questions before we get rolling? All right, excellent. So as we've talked about, obviously, what determines how long a muscle can contract for starts with how long we decide to, how many neural action potentials we produce, how much acetylcholine is produced. But inside the muscle cell, there are really two resources that are required for the muscle to contract. What are those two resources? There you go, excellent. Calcium and ATP. Now, of those two things, is calcium used up in the process of the muscle contraction? No, it's not, right? It binds to the troponin, changes the shape of the troponin, lets go of the troponin, but it isn't used up in this process. So how we limit it is by how much is available in the cytosol, how much we pump into the sarcoblast reticulum, how much we release from the sarcoblast reticulum. So it is an important limiting factor, but it's not used up in the process. ATP, on the other hand, is absolutely used up. As we know, our myosin head phosphorylates, or again, splits the ATP into ADP and a phosphate. And when it rips off that phosphate, that releases a lot of energy. So how much ATP is available is a huge limiting factor on how long a muscle can contract for. So being able to know where that ATP comes from, how that ATP is available, and how much ATP is available, how much energy is available, allows us to understand uh, how long we can contract a muscle for. And as it turns out, there are really four main sources of ATP. How we get ATP for, uh, to be able to contract a muscle, there are four main sources of ATP. The first, and hopefully most obvious of this, is just stored ATP. All cells, not just muscle cells, but all cells, have free-floating ATP inside of them. This is important because as we know, there are pumps and transporters and other things that a muscle cell is doing. So when a muscle cell is relaxed, it has stored ATP floating around inside of it. So when we start contracting the muscle, the first thing that's gonna happen is we are gonna start using up that stored ATP. 
All right, it's the primary force, it's the first source. But as we mentioned, there is lots of stuff that use ATP pumps and transporters and other things along those lines that use it, other metabolic things like kinases and things along those lines that are using it inside the cell. So our muscles, our myosin is competing with that. And also, if a lot of things inside the, the cell uses ATP, do we typically want to have a massive amount of ATP readily available? Think of it this way. If you've got $1,000, do you keep all of it in your pocket? just cash ready to be used for anything so that as you wander around the street you can just be buying things left and right no right once it's in your pocket it's practically gone at that point so you don't necessarily want to have it all around there's lots of things you can use it for and when there's lots of things that you can use it for you're going to use it for all those things and it'll be used up pretty uh um readily so while there is stored atp there isn't a massive amount of stored atp Right. So if we were to contract a muscle just relying on the stored ATP that was inside of it, that contraction would only last for about two to 10 seconds. So I'd contract that muscle 1,001, 1,002, and then it would fail because I would be out of ATP. And is that how long you can contract your muscles for? Can every single one of the muscles in your body only be contracted for 10 seconds at the most? And then that muscle just fails on you? No, of course not. So luckily we have other ways of getting uh, energy for the muscle cell. And again, I like the money analogy because the money analogy is great. You've got cash in your pocket. Right? If you have $1,000, then it might be useful to keep 100 of that in your pocket. But you don't want to be walking around with all 1,000. So what you do is you take the other 900 and you put it in the bank. Because the convenient thing about a bank is you've got an ATM card. You've got a debit card that can allow you access to it pretty easily without having to carry it on hand. Well, this right here is our bank, our ATP bank. It is a special molecule called creatine phosphate. Let's see what happens here. At rest, when we are at rest, what happens is there is a lot of ATP in the muscle cell, okay? So what happens is we have a special protein called creatine. And what creatine does is it binds to ATP and it takes the phosphate. And the energy, all right? That's kind of what a pump does, but here's the difference. It doesn't use the energy. Instead, it stores it. Instead, it stores it. So if we were to do this, it stores it as stupid. It stores the energy. So let's write this out as an equation. What happens is creatine basically binds to the ATP and steals the phosphate from it. When it does that, obviously by ripping off the phosphate, it forms ADP. But like I said, what happens is the creatine stores the phosphate and stores the energy. So the creatine becomes creatine phosphate. This creatine phosphate is an energy molecule. So while the muscle is sitting here at rest, creatine will find a random ATP, rip its phosphate off, becoming creatine phosphate, and then that ADP runs back to the mitochondria to get another phosphate put on, and everything's happy because our muscle is at rest. And so when our muscle is at rest, what happens is that this equation goes to the right. But then we start to contract the muscle. When we contract that muscle, what happens is the amount of ATP drops.
right? You're using the ATP with the myosin heads, so the amount of ATP drops. And what happens is that the ATP drops and there's now more ADP in the cell. And when that occurs, what happens is our creatine phosphate gives the phosphate back to the ADP. And when it gives it back to the ADP, it makes ATP again. So notice we have this same reaction, creatine plus ATP equals oops, ADP plus creatine phosphate. However, now that the muscle is contracting, what ends up happening is that this chemical reaction goes to the left. So notice, and I will cheat here by making this smaller, when there is a large amount of ATP, this is going to go to the right. When there is a large amount of ADP, because the muscle is contracting, it is going to go to the left. Notice in this process, and this is one of the important things, is that we are not making new energy, right? When you use that ATM card to pay for your groceries instead of the cash that you have in your pocket, you're not making new money. You just have stored money that you're taking advantage of. And that's really the key. Creatine phosphate, and I'm just gonna abbreviate it CP here, although I am gonna make this bigger, is a stored energy molecule. So we're not making new energy. Just like when you take $20 out of the bank using your ATM card, you didn't make $20. You used part of your storage. And that's what happens here. This is stored energy. It is a much more stable stored energy molecule. So we have about three times as much creatine phosphate inside of a muscle cell than we have ATP, but it's still just stored energy. We're not making new energy, right? Just like taking money out of your savings account doesn't make more money, you're just taking it out of storage. Eventually, once you use that up, you need to get a job and you need to make more money. And the same thing happens here. This creatine phosphate, like that ATM card, is a quick and easy way to get access of money. It's a quick and easy way to get access to the energy, but it's not making new energy. So once this stored energy is gone, then we definitely are going to have to start making new. All right, so notice these first two, ATP and creatine phosphate, are both readily available stored energy. But ultimately, if we're going to continue to contain a, maintain a contraction, we're going to need to make energy to be able to do that. All right, questions on this? I hope I've done a good job of describing this, but let's go look at the pretty pictures that go along with the pretty words. So the key here is we have this reversible uh, chemical reaction. Creatine plus ATP produces creatine phosphate and ADP, right? A lot of bodybuilders take creatine as a supplement. Why would you take that as a supplement? Because uh, the, by taking that supplement, the small amount of it that you're able to get into your muscle cells can store more ATP, allowing you to produce more contractions, produce more energy, use that muscle for a longer period of time without fatigue, because you're able to store more energy inside of the cell. Of course, you're cluttering the cell with more 
uh, proteins, most of the creatine that you uh, absorb in that energy shake doesn't get absorbed into your body. Uh, very little of it that gets absorbed in your body then gets absorbed in your muscle cells. So again, the value of it is somewhat questionable, but I won't argue the, the, that because I know there are some people who swear by the stuff. Uh, and that's fine. But the, the, the physics of it is definitely there. The molecular biology of that is definitely there. And like I said, it is a more um, stable form of energy storage. Therefore, we're able to have a lot more of it in the muscle cell, almost three times as much. So again, if we were just going to contract a muscle based on our stored energy, the ATP and the creatine phosphate, we would be able to contract that muscle for anywhere between 15 and about 20 seconds. But again, if you're going to stand, right, if you're going to have one of those jobs where you're inside of a, uh, a um, toll booth, collecting dollar bills at the, you know, a Golden Gate Bridge or something like that, you need to be able to stand for more than 15 or 20 seconds. So while this is great for a short contraction, if we're going to do a sustained contraction, we are going to need to have to make new ATP. And luckily, we know how to do that. Right? Aerobic respiration, or remember what we also called cellular respiration. I remember with cellular, assuming I can spell it correctly. Respiration, as we talked about, we are taking sugar or fat, but we'll start with sugar, and we are breaking it down completely. And what do we need to break it down completely again? Come on, what is it that we require to completely break down sugar? There you go, oxygen. We need oxygen to completely break down that sugar. When we do that, what we get as a result is energy. That energy is then used to make ATP. And then as a waste product, we get carbon dioxide and we get water. Oops. So, all right, that is our cellular respiration. And remind me again, where does cellular respiration take place? If you don't know or can't remember, cheat and look at the picture. In the mitochondria. In the mitochondria, when oxygen is available, we are able to take that sugar and we are able to break it down completely to produce a lot of energy, carbon dioxide, and uh, water as a waste, right? This is the whole reason you... We breathe so you can get the oxygen into the cells so they can make the ATP and we can release the waste product that is the carbon dioxide as a result of this. The advantage of this process, as I mentioned, is twofold. First, it breaks the sugar down completely. And as we know, sugar typically is made of a five or six carbon ring. So it has a lot of bonds in it. And so it releases lots of energy. In fact, so much energy that a single sugar can produce uh, between uh, 34 and 36 ATP. It is a very, very efficient process, right? Think of that hybrid car. You have that hybrid car where you break down one gallon of gasoline and you get 50 miles to that one gallon of gasoline. Well, that's what's happening here. The advantage of this is that it is incredibly efficient. It is very, very efficient. So as I mentioned, how long can you stand for? How long can you walk for? Ever, right? Everything is walking distance if you have the time because you can stand or walk for hours. So this is an incredibly efficient way that we are able to use the mitochondria, break down those bonds and make massive amounts of ATP. All right. We comfortable with that? Excellent. 
How long can you stand for again? I'll wait to answer. A long time. A long time, excellent. How long can you sprint for? Not very long, personally. Not exactly, exactly. And that's the problem with this process. While the advantage is that it is very, very efficient, the disadvantage of this process is it takes a lot of time. I don't know how many of you have taken like 300 or 400. In those, you will actually talk about the process that takes place in the mitochondria, the citric acid cycle, or what is also known as the Krebs cycle, about how it is all broken down and done that. And because I know you'll get that in those classes, we are not going to study the Krebs cycle. We didn't when we talked about the cell. We're not going to do it now. But what I will tell you is it takes a lot of time to be able to do this. So while it is a very efficient process, it's a relatively slow process. What this means is that while it, well, let's go back up to where it's very efficient. It can produce enough ATP for moderate activities that last hours. The problem with is it takes time. So if our goal is to contract a muscle at its maximal intensity, aerobic respiration can only produce about a third of the energy we would need for that. So again, if we're going to sprint, aerobic respiration isn't gonna be able to produce enough uh, energy for us to be able to do that. So we need a fourth way, a quick and dirty way to make ATP so that we are able to do those maximal intensity types of processes. The problem is that it's not as efficient. Like I said, it's gonna be quick and dirty. And as a result of that, we are going to get some bad wastes and that's why it's not something that can be sustained for a long period of time. All right, questions on aerobic respiration before we finish this off. Again, hopefully I've done a good job of describing this with my words, but let's look at the slides. Again, this requires oxygen. It fully breaks down glucose, but also fatty acids and even amino acids can be broken down this way. Super efficient, 34 to 36. And again, notice it isn't a precise number because it depends on the electron transport chain. And again, if you've taken uh, 400, then that makes sense to you. If you haven't, don't worry about it. But the gross is somewhere between 34 and 36 ATP that it is going to be able to produce. And again, it can produce enough energy for hours of moderate activity. You can stand or walk for days, thanks to this ability to efficiently produce ATP. However, that bear with an ax comes in the room and you need to sprint away, aerobic respiration by itself isn't gonna be enough. Luckily, we have the quick and dirty way to produce ATP, and that is, anaerobic respiration. Notice they've changed pictures on us here, but let's cheat and go back to the previous picture real quickly. Notice if we go back to the previous picture, and I'm gonna use my highlighter to emphasize this. Here is our glucose right here. And notice the first thing that happens is that glucose, uh, which is a six carbon sugar, is broken down into two pyruvates or pyruvic acids, both of which, so it's basically two, three carbon molecules. So our first thing that happens is our glucose is split. They of course have a fancy name for the splitting of glucose. And what is the fancy name for the splitting of glucose? There you go, glycolysis. Glycolysis, the splitting of glucose. That's essentially what we're looking at on the next page. Notice here, our glucose is broken down uh, via glycolysis into pyruvic acid. 
Now, when eight, when oxygen is available, hold on, let me cheat. I got to move some of these things out of my way here. When oxygen, so with, whoops, that's not a W, with oxygen, that pyruvate is able to enter into the mitochondria. And we're able to break it down completely via aerobic respiration. Without oxygen, what ends up happening is that pyruvate gets converted into lactic acid. And lactic acid is a toxin. Now, notice one more thing. This process of glycolysis does produce ATP. However, as you can see, oops, oh. in this, one glucose gives us two ATP. That's still not a two. So from one glucose for causing 32 to 36 ATP, we've gone from one glucose to two ATP. We have gone from that hybrid to that Hummer. Right? If you think about how energy efficient that Hummer is, it's not very energy efficient, uh, but that hybrid is. And that's what's happened here. We have switched cars. We have gone from an engine that is incredibly efficient to one that is incredibly inefficient. So again, what happens here is without oxygen, we still split the glucose. into pyruvate using glycolysis. Glycolysis, we get two ATP, but without oxygen, what ends up happening is that pyruvate cannot enter the mitochondria, and instead is converted into lactic acid. As we mentioned, this lactic acid is a toxin to the muscle cell that damages the muscle cell. And as we also talked about, it also, because it's an acid, changes the pH of the muscle cell. And as we talked about, is one of the prime factors that leads to fatigue. So it's quick and dirty, but it uses up our fuel very, very quickly. All right, you can drive a Hummer, but you got to stop much more frequently for gas. You can't get nearly as if, if both a Hummer and a hybrid had a 10 gallon tank, right? That's fine for the hybrid to be able to drive, but with your Hummer, you'd barely get from gas station to gas station at that point. It wouldn't be an efficient way to do it because it uses the energy much, much too quickly. So not only do you use up your fuel much more rapidly, but it also produces this toxin that causes the muscle to fatigue, which is why it can produce that enough energy for that sprint, for that maximal intensity sprint. But as someone mentioned, you can't sprint for very long. You can stand for hours, you can't sprint for hours. And that's because of this right here. All right, hopefully that makes some sense. Let's look at the pretty words again. So again, what happens here is we have our glycolysis, glucose is converted into pyruvate, pyruvate or pyruvic acid. Those pyruvates are then converted into lactic acid. It's a quick way. The advantage of it's fast. We can produce lots of ATP this way, but it is not efficient. So it's going to use up your fuel very, very quickly. And the other problem with it is it produces that lactic acid. And that lactic acid is one of the major factors that is going to lead to muscle fatigue damages the muscle, affects the efficiency of the muscle, 
and ultimately leads to the muscle fatigue. All right, questions on where we get our ATP for a muscle contraction. So notice, if we were going to sprint from here to the parking lot at school or whatever it is, some, you know, again, we're in the classroom, it's easier to do this. If you were gonna do the 100 yard dash, right? You were gonna do that. Uh, these are the four sources of energy that you would need for that. You would need your store energy with the ATP and the creatine phosphate, and you would need to produce ATP both aerobically and aerobically to produce enough ATP for you to sprint that 100 yard dash. Questions on that? Now, it always confuses, uh, concerns me when you guys are this, this quiet, but I'll continue to uh, fool myself into believing that when you're quiet, that means you understand this and we'll move on to the next concept. All right, and that next concept is muscle fatigue. Again, we talked about, and I tried to emphasize this definition before, but I wanna make sure we understand it. Muscle fatigue is not muscle failure. Muscle fatigue is when the muscle cannot perform at the required level of activity. Again, as I mentioned, there is that starting pitcher for the Cincinnati Reds who on the very first day of, of, uh, of first game, first pitch, throws a 100 mile an hour fastball. By the sixth inning, his fastball is only going 95 miles an hour. 95 miles an hour is still pretty darn impressive and a heck of a lot faster than I can throw a baseball. But he was able to throw 100 before. So when he's trying to throw that 100 mile an hour fastball and it's only going 95 miles an hour, that muscle is not performing at the level that he requires. And guess what? That muscle is fatigued. Right? When I was trying to hold that textbook up for my principal and ultimately my arm went down, is it because my arm was non-functional after that? No, right? after I got swatted, I was able to go back to the classroom and I could still use it to write my notes or do whatever else, eat my sandwich at lunch. Right? I may have been sore, I may have been tired, but the muscle isn't non-functional. Muscle fatigue means it cannot perform at the required level. Now, what's interesting is our full uh, mechanism by which this occurs is not fully understood, but we do know a lot of the components of it. When we talk about the things that fatigue the muscle, let's go ahead and write this out first. Uh, what are some of the factors that you think might influence how a muscle fatigues or why a muscle fatigues? Is it maybe if uh, it's uh, rested or uh, or tired? True, right? But so what makes it, what's the difference? What makes the difference between a muscle that is rested and tired? What would make a muscle tired and cause it to be fatigued? Give me some examples of some types of things. Passive activity. Sure, absolutely. So, but again, that muscle activity is going to cause a couple of things. So excellent. Damage is a great example. However, again, I... I I worry sometimes when we use a term like damage, because again, you, you hear people talk about all the time how when you are in the gym working out those muscles, you are damaging the muscle. And damaging the muscle is what makes the muscle bigger. When we talk about damage, what we're really talking about is damage at the molecular level. Right? What we are doing is we are damaging the proteins, damaging and misaligning the proteins. I am not talking about straining the muscle or tearing the muscle cell or misaligning a fascicle or anything along those lines. Right? That is not what we talk about when people talk about damaging the muscle cell. What we're talking about is damage or misaligning the proteins, right? Our Z discs or actin become misaligned. Right, remember this is a sliding filament theory. If some of the filaments become kinked, it's not gonna slide nearly as efficiently and isn't gonna be able to generate as much tension. Right, uh, we can break myosin heads or actin filaments.
If we are damaging the myosin heads, fewer myosin heads can grab and pull. If we're damaging actin, there's less actin for the myosin to grab and pull on. All of these things are things that will reduce the tension that can be produced. The, all of this reduces the tension, the force that the muscle cell can produce. <clears throat> so that so when we talk about damage, that is definitely one of the factors. But again, we're talking about molecular damage. We're not talking about damaging the muscle cell. Excellent. pH changes. Obviously, some of that is from the lactic acid, as we talked about, and we'll talk about lactic acid more in just a minute. Uh, lactic acid is one of the things, but also there's other uh, uh, other biological. Uh, acids that are produced, biological, metabolic, let's say that, I like that better, other metabolic acids that are produced. And remember, as we talked about with that, pH changes affect proteins. Remember we talked about especially our troponin. As our proteins are affected by the pH, again, they can become misaligned or less effective, right? Again, nothing else could be wrong with the muscle cell. But as, uh, absolutely, that's another great one, Madison. We'll talk about that in a second. Nothing could be wrong with the muscle cell at all. But if nothing else had happened, but troponin changed its shape so that it's harder for calcium to bind to it, fewer calcium are gonna be able to bind to the troponin, Fewer troponin are going to move fewer uh, tropomyosins. Fewer myosin heads can grab and pull. And the muscle cell's contraction is weaker. Absolutely. And it's not just pH that can change the shape of proteins, but temperature can as well. <clears throat> so the same way proteins are sensitive to pH change, proteins are sensitive to temperature changes. And of course, why does the temperature change? Because the myosin heads are motors. As we talked about it, they convert uh, chemical energy into mechanical energy. But they're not 100% efficient. Remember, as we said, in some cells, as much as 75% of the energy can be lost as heat. So that temperature change can modify the proteins, cause it to uh, a, a function less efficiently. What else? What else determines how long you can contract a muscle for? What did we just finish talking about? You choosing to? Decision? True. Well, there is the decision, but again, in muscle fatigue, I want to throw the ball 100 miles an hour. It doesn't go 100 miles an hour. So it isn't really so much that I'm consciously deciding I don't want to throw it 100 miles an hour anymore. I'm still trying to throw it 100 miles an hour, but it's not anymore. Energy, absolutely. The energy available. And again, that energy is, of course, ATP. We use up our energy resources. That means the free-floating ATP, that means the creatine phosphate, that means the glucose we're using to break it down. All of those things, all of those energy resources, metabolic resources that we're using to make energy, we're emptying the tank. And if we empty the tank, there's no ATP or very little ATP left, then our muscle can't perform at the level. But it isn't just about energy uh, molecules either. Uh, as we've hinted at, uh, when we stimulate the muscle cell, we open up those cation channels, massive amount of sodium comes in, a massive amount of potassium, although not as much, but some potassium leaves. Calcium is moving in and out of the cell. So another thing that can affect the functionality of the cell is ionic imbalances. <clears throat> Right, so things like sodium 
things like calcium, things like potassium, the levels of those ions inside and outside the cell can modify the behavior and affect the cell uh, so that it doesn't function properly. What else? Can you think of anything else that might? Temperature, pH. Oh, another important energy resource, although we could even make it its own if we wanted to, but obviously oxygen <clears throat> is one of those, <coughs> excuse me, um, molecules that is necessary for the production of ATP. But there's one other big factor. Let's go back to lactic acid. As we mentioned, lactic acid is a toxin in the muscle cell. Yes, it changes the pH, but it's also a toxin, and that toxin can damage the muscle cell. Of course, if it's damaging to the muscle cell, does the muscle cell necessarily want it inside of the muscle cell? No. No. So one of the things that happens as we build up, as we gain lactic acid, that lactic acid is released into the blood interstitial fluid but from the interstitial fluid it then ends up into the blood and once it's in the blood the goal is to get it to like to the liver or the kidneys so we can uh, you know get it out of the body or break it down or do something like that but something else interesting happens to that lactic acid when it gets into the blood. Let's go back to that example of me in middle school having to hold those textbooks up, right? I had to hold the textbooks up until the principal got tired. And if I wasn't able to do that, I got swatted and then sent back to the classroom. And so I lasted my five minutes or whatever it was of trying to hold that textbook up before I finally failed, my muscle failed, and I got swatted. But what if instead, if I couldn't hold that book up, I was going to get shot in the head? Do you think I might have been able to hold that book up a little bit longer if instead of getting swatted, I was going to get shot in the head? Well, let's take a more realistic example, right? My wife is one of those weird people, very, very weird people, who for some odd reason like running and then running some more and then running even some more after that. She's one of those that have done a marathon, right? Any, mar any marathon runners, any of you weirdos out there in the group? That one, no. <laughs> Somebody thinks it's hilarious. All right, well, if you happen to know one of these odd type people, uh, one of the interesting things that you will learn about marathon runners is that they only actually typically run the marathon on the day of the marathon. While they do a massive amount of training, all of their training runs are usually under 20 miles, whereas a marathon, of course, is 26.2 miles. The reason for this is something really interesting happens to these marathon runners when they hit that 20-mile mark. When they meet, hit that 20-mile mark, their body starts screaming at them, oh, my God, you are going to die if you take one more step. And being the odd uh, individuals that they are, what they do is they take one more step. And their body goes, no, I really mean it this time. If you take one more step, you are going to die. And they take another step. And they take another step. And they take another step. And they, they break through that wall, right? They talk about this wall. You hit the wall, and then you break through it. That wall is something that we actually call systemic fatigue. Systemic fatigue is this interesting concept of the central nervous system, of the brain. That what happens is when that lactic acid gets into the blood, what happens is lactic acid gets into our cerebral spinal fluid. And what happens is our brain senses, hey, right, I'm working out really hard right now. My muscles are working hard enough to produce lactic acid. 
And if they're working hard enough to produce lactic acid, they could get hurt. And I don't want my muscles to get hurt. And so what our brain actually tells us is that, you know what? You can't run anymore. That's it. You're done. You can't hold that book up anymore. You're done. You can't do it. You're done. The muscles are done. You're going to fail. And you stop. Right. If I told you to sprint as far as you could right now, go out onto the front of your house, sprint down the street as far as you could, you would get to whatever X distance was. But if a bear with an axe was chasing you, then you'd be able to sprint a lot further. Why? Because the first time you stopped, you stopped because your brain was telling you you can't do it anymore. Basically, this is a protective reflex. where your brain lies to you and says, you can't do it. You can't take another step. You can't go one more step forward. You can't keep running. You can't hold that book up. You can't do those things because it is trying to protect your muscles. But if the motivation is there, you're gonna get shot in the head. You have to finish that race. That bear with an ax is chasing you. Then clearly those muscles are able to continue to function. So a lot of times when we stop doing a muscle activity, we stop doing that muscle activity because it's our brain telling us that the muscle can't do it anymore and not even because the muscle truly fails. So that systemic fatigue based on that lactic acid is another important protective reflex that again affects our abilities to contract a muscle. Uh, it isn't what causes adrenaline, but you, you kind of have the right idea. When that bear with an ax comes in, one of the things that happens is we release adrenaline as part of that stress response. One of the things with that stress response is to dilate the airways so we can get more oxygen in, uh, increase our heart rate so we're pumping that oxygen more rapidly to the muscle cells. It actually causes glucose to be released from our liver, uh, energy to be released from our adipose so that that uh, glucose is readily available because we are in that stress situation. Stress situations are, again, from a biological standpoint, life and death situations, right? In ancient times, bears with axes roamed the countryside. And so when you saw a bear with an ax, you had two choices. You had to fight that bear with an ax or you had to outrun the person who was next to you. Right, that's that fight or flight response, exactly. Right, and that's how we deal with stress. So if you think about the things that we need to keep it going, like the ATP, like the glucose, like the oxygen, that adrenaline makes that more readily available so that we can, 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 we can do that physical activity for a longer period of time, not a very long period of time. Right, again, you can only still only sprint for so long, you can still only fight that bear with an ax for so long but hopefully it's long enough to help us to deal with that stressful situation. And that's a problem. This is ingrained in our DNA from a biological standpoint where stress is life and death situations, right? You very rarely see bears with axes these days. Now the things that stress us out are that 10 page paper that's due on Friday or that lab and lecture exam that's on Thursday. And the problem with that is we still get that same life and death stress uh, stimulus from it. But the way you deal with that is by sitting there and reading the textbook or doing here, sitting here and typing on the computer as you're doing that. Notice our body's still releasing all of those resources into our body to deal with that physical stress, but we're not doing physical activity anymore for it, right? That's one of the problems with stress. Stress is horrible. I was, I was glorious before I had kids. Right, I had hair, I had a nice body, right? All of those things, but the stress of kids, right, has just destroyed me. I'm horrible now, hideous, as a result of that, because of that effect that stress has that on our bodies. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. So I've done it here. I think with the pretty words, I think we've done a good job of this. I think this pretty much reiterates all the same stuff. Oops, wrong button. So again, depletion of the metabolic waste, ionic imbalances, change in pH, damage to the muscle cell, and that systemic fatigue from lactic acid. So again, those are the key factors that cause a muscle to be fatigued. And here's the other key. Not all fatigue is the same, right? So 
you have two different athletes, professional Olympic class athletes, a sprinter and a marathon runner. Which one of those two activities actually cause more fatigue, sprinting or running a marathon? Sprinting. Sprinting. So I've got one sprinting and one marathon. Let's get some more. Who else? Marathon. Okay. Second for a marathon. Second for sprint. Third for marathon. Third for sprint. Excellent. We're split about 50-50. All right. So let's take it to the Olympics and let's take it one step closer and think about this. For a professional athlete like Usain Bolt, how many typical sprints does he do during the course of a day at the Olympics? All right, it could be many, exactly, right? He's maybe doing the, you know, he's doing the semifinals in the 100, but he's got to run the qualifying race in the 200, or maybe he's running the qualifying for the, uh, for the relay or things along those lines, or, or, or swimming is another great example, right? Swimmers sometimes will run three, four, five heats during the course of a day because there are all these different races that they're in. How many marathons does a marathon runner during the course of the day? Only one. How many marathons does that marathoner run during the course of an Olympics? Just one. I know it's not as intuitive, but actually the slower, longer sustained activity is much more fatiguing than the rapid sprint. That rapid sprint, sprint may, de de uh, may, uh, uh, may deplete the metabolic resources very quickly uh, because it's a very rapid breeze burn out of uh, burnout from that blocks kind of thing. But you typically don't get the massive change in pH. You typically don't get the massive amount of damage to it the same way. And those metabolic resources are easier to replenish. That marathoner, every step of their marathon isn't necessarily as impactful. But the fact that they have to take, you know, three million steps to complete that marathon, it's a much more prolonged activity and you're much more likely to get the long-term systemic fatigue, the long-term protein damage, the major depletion and, and ionic imbalances. And so typically, while it may not seem intuitive, the longer, slower activity is actually more uh, fatiguing than that rapid sprint. And again, while you, it may not seem intuitive when you think about the way they do these races in swimming or in, you know, in the race running and things along those lines, you actually see that in the fact that these sprinters, these swimmers run multiple heats during the course of the day because they're exhausted after that first one, but they then pretty much are able to, uh, to recover from that fatigue fairly quickly, whereas that marathon runner typically runs one race in Olympics. All right, excellent. Now, obviously once that pitcher is now throwing the ball 95 miles an hour, that doesn't mean he can never throw 100 miles an hour again. He just needs that muscle to recover. Recovery is the reestablishment of normal conditions. And there are a couple main processes that are involved in this recovery. Uh, once is obviously uh, the repair and replenishing of the resources. So for instance, any damage uh, to the actin myosin damaged proteins are repaired and new proteins can be produced to uh, strengthen the muscle, right? This is why, right, with your good uh, solid workout routine, you're not doing arms and back on Monday to turn around and do arms and back on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday, you're back to arms and back, switch things up on Thursday with back and arms and finish the week off with arms and back. Is that your workout regime? Yeah, of course it is, absolutely, because now we live on Zoom. Nobody sees the bottom half of your body, so all anybody cares about is arms and back. But back in ancient times when people could see all of you, you wanted to mix things up. You wanted to give time after you used a muscle for it to repair and to replenish. 
uh, its resources. So part of it is about uh, repairing those damaged proteins, um, reestablishing uh, ion concentrations, right, things along those lines, getting rid of the lactic acid and like I said, also replenishing the metabolic resources. However, there is something that is gonna be needed really, really a lot for all of this. All of these processes are going to require ATP. And most importantly, if we are going to efficiently produce ATP, what do we need? What do we need if we're gonna efficiently produce ATP? Not your question. Glucose, true, but what else are we gonna need? to efficiently, we don't need glucose to efficiently produce it. To efficiently produce it, we need oxygen. So the two main processes that we require, the first is to repay our oxygen debt. What happens is we produce an oxygen debt inside of the muscle cell that needs to be repaid. Right, we need oxygen to replenish uh, the oxygen that was in the myo, uh, myoglobin. Remember, myoglobin is that protein that stores oxygen uh, for use inside the muscle cell. So we need, so we used it when we were uh, used up all the oxygen that was stored there when we were contracting the muscle. So now we need to replace the oxygen to get rid of the lactic acid. Uh, we can use oxygen to convert it back to pyruvate. And if we can convert it back to pyruvate, it can then, with oxygen, enter the mitochondria to produce ATP. Once we have that ATP, we can then reestablish ionic concentrations. We can make the proteins that are necessary. We can do all these things. So we need ATP and we need oxygen. So the two big, huge things we have to do is we need to get rid of that lactic acid. We need to repay that oxygen debt so that we can reestablish normal conditions. And again, you may not have thought of it in these terms, but I know you're aware of this oxygen debt. Because while you're sitting here calmly listening to me talk, your respiratory rate is about 12 breaths per minute. If you were to get up and run around your house 20 times, as you increased your metabolic activity inside of your house, your respiratory rate would go up. Because you're using the muscles more readily, you need more oxygen. And after running around the house 20 times, once you came and sat in your chair again, you wouldn't be using that energy for producing ATP anymore. So would your respiratory rate instantly go back to the normal 12 rest, rest per minute? No, your respiration rate stays higher for a prolonged period of time because we need to repay this oxygen debt. However, one of my favorite things about this oxygen debt is that the oxygen debt is at the cellular level. It is the muscle cell that is having the oxygen debt. If you put a pulse ox on somebody who, as they were sitting calmly in a classroom, as they were running around the room 20 times, or as soon as they sat back down after running around, and you put that pulse ox on their finger to measure the oxygen carrying capacity of their blood, the oxygen carrying capacity of their blood is the same. The oxygen debt isn't in your blood, it is in your cells. 
And the reason that amuses me so much is because if you ever watch football, like I like to do, especially on a defensive player, what happens is the uh, cornerback intercepts the football, runs it back for a touchdown, runs to the sidelines, and then does two things. The first thing he does is he crows for the TV, you know, saying hi, mom, waving to everybody and all of that. And then the second thing he does is grab an oxygen mask and put that oxygen mask on to get more oxygen because he's exhausted from that activity. He is fatigued from that activity, but that fatigue is at the cellular level. And actually putting that oxygen mask over his face doesn't do anything. It doesn't really change the oxygen. I mean, it, it, it slightly increases the oxygen in his blood, but that's not helping with the oxygen debt. The oxygen debt is at a cellular level. So what that oxygen mask does is it dilates some of the blood vessels, especially the blood vessels of his brain, making him feel a little bit more alert, makes him feel a little bit better, but it doesn't actually help to repay the oxygen debt. It just makes him feel good. And that's why they, again, they, out here in Roseville, they used to have an oxygen bar where you could come and you could, they had like these hookahs set up where you could breathe different flavors of oxygen, right? And, and people did it because it made them feel good because it dilates the blood vessels, makes you feel a little bit more alert. All right, it makes you feel better, but it doesn't really do anything. All right. I don't know if it's still there. Now that marijuana is uh, legal, it's probably just a uh, pot joint now instead of that, but I don't know. I haven't been there. Um, all right. Questions on that? All right. So again, I think I've hopefully done a good job of spelling this out with my words. Let's look at the pretty words from the textbook. Again, we need to remove and recycle. Oh, I know what I need, so I needed to say, so we'll do that in a second. Remove and recycle lactic acid. Part of that is in the muscle cell where it gets converted back into pyruvate with oxygen. And then with oxygen, we can use that pyruvate to make ATP. But remember, some of that was also released into the blood. And so the lactic acid that was released into the blood needs to be broken down and recycled in our liver cells, or it can be released by our kidneys. And then the second thing we have to do is we have to pay back that oxygen debt. Right, replace the oxygen, replace the ATP, replace the, uh, the creatine phosphate, get rid of the lactic acid. Uh, again, we have to use the pumps. Uh, act, we need ATP. Oops. Here. We also need ATP to run the pumps to be able to um, reestablish ionic concentration, and we need ATP to make proteins. to repair and replace any damaged myofibrils or any damaged sarcomeres. So again, we need all this oxygen, this oxygen dent, our metabolism stays elevated for a prolonged period of time. This of course is in the muscle cell, but if you think about it, our muscle cells are not the only organ systems that incur an oxygen debt when we contract. So when we actively use our muscles, when we fatigue our muscles, Other organ systems incur an oxygen debt. Like what? What other, uh, what other organs or organ systems? Give me some examples of organs and organ systems that are going to incur an oxygen debt when you get up and run around the house 20 times. Excellent, our heart because it's beating faster, it need, it's gonna incur an oxygen debt. Our lungs, or at least the muscles of our lungs, those respiratory muscles that we talked about. Um, so the, let's do it that way, I like that better. Respiratory muscles. I like the diaphragm, the internal and external intercostal, sternocleidomastoid, all of those. Excellent, what else? true but remember the muscles are what are incurring the debt the muscle system is that already so what other organs or organ systems outside of the muscular system you're running around the room 20 times what other organ systems right obviously respiratory system is going to uh, cardiovascular system is going to I can think of at least two more systems that are going to or organs that are going to incur an oxygen debt what are those other ones going to be Digestive, is there necessarily a lot of, of activity going on with your digestive system when you are running around the room? 
True, we do need to necessarily get more glucose in. However, when we are physically active, it's more going to be about getting energy from the cell itself. So uh, increasing digestive activity afterwards may be something that's going to happen, but it didn't incur the oxygen debt from the actual activity. Cardiovascular, yes, blood vessel and hearts, heart and blood vessels, I would give you. Endocrine, again, the hormones aren't as much involved in this uh, during this process when they're, when they're doing that. Let's think about, so what else happens to your body when you get up and run around the room 20 times? What else is going to occur to your body? What about your integumentary system? You're absolutely correct. That is the right one. But what specifically in your integumentary system becomes active when you run around the room 20 times? Sweat glands. There you go. Exactly. Of course, we're a sophisticated anatomy and physiology students now, so we can be more specific than saying sweat glands. We could actually be more precise. Which glands are the sweat glands that would be? If only we knew the name of the glands that produced watery sweat. This is a cumulative class. What are the glands in your skin that produce watery sweat? Ekrin, there you go. Excellent. And I think you guys are forgetting the other obvious one. If I'm going to get my legs to move to run around the house 20 times, how do I tell my legs to run around the house 20 times? Nervous system, absolutely. If you think about it, our somatic motor neurons, as we talked about, are releasing acetylcholine. They're bringing all that calcium into them, which they then need to pump back out. They have to make more acetylcholine or endocytose the acetylcholine. So our motor neurons get tired from firing action potentials. So those motor neurons also incur an oxygen debt and need to recover from that as well. Excellent. So there you go. Cardiovascular, respiratory, integumentary, nervous system, all of those. Absolutely, there's a significant oxygen debt. We haven't talked about the nervous system yet, but as we'll see, uh, as much ions and stuff are moving into the muscle cell when the muscle cell contracts, there's even more going on with the neuron. So replacing the neurotransmitter, putting ions back where they need to go. Absolutely. It's a big, huge uh, neuro uh, oxygen debt that they incur from being active as well. And like I said, we'll talk about the process of uh, producing a neural action potential when we get to the nervous system. What I like about doing the muscular system first is we kind of get a baby introduction to action potentials in these concepts. And that's going to help us to make sense of the nervous system when we get there. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. With that then, that is everything I wanted to cover today from a lecture standpoint. So we have one more lecture left. Uh, tomorrow, finally, we are going to finish off skeletal muscle. We're mostly done with skeletal muscle. There's just one more big major concept of the fact that I've been lying to you uh, continuously for the past two weeks uh, that we need to discuss to finish off skeletal muscle. And then we will finally, at the end of next class's lecture, uh, be able to finish off talking about, uh, come back to, I should say, talking about smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, and talking about some of the concepts of, now that we understand how a skeletal muscle contracts, we need to talk about how that relates to what happens in a cardiac muscle and what happens in smooth muscle. So we are going to do all of that tomorrow. Uh, so what we are done for lecture today, we will now take our second break and when we come back from break. We will pick up where we left off with our arm muscles going in uh, origins, insertions and actions. And as I mentioned, the good news is we're done with all the origins and insertions of our arms. So we just have to identify the rest of the muscles, their actions and talk about those. So we will do that after the break. So any questions before we take our break? All right, then let's switch to, actually, let's, I'll come back here for now. All right, so what we will do is go ahead and take our second break now. It is 10.13, so let's come back and restart 
at 1028. Start the recording at the time. All right. All right. I will see you guys in 15 minutes. Any questions before we dive back in? All right, stunned silence usually means that uh, you all completely understand and understand it so much in fact that you would like me to make the test harder. So I will definitely do that. All right, excellent. Now, we are going to continue down our muscles of the arm. And as we do that, uh, we are gonna continue to talk about muscles that move the uh, arm through space. And the next is a group of muscles. Do that. Now that we can see here from the picture from your textbook, but as I mentioned, and as I showed you on uh, the other day, if we, oh, no, that's not what I wanna show you. I want to show you this here. We are not responsible for the origins and insertions of these, but if you remember, I did have this pretty picture from the classroom that I think does a great job of showing these muscles isolated. Here we have the scapula and the humerus and the clavicle. So we have our pectoral girdle and our shoulder joint here. Notice here, we can see that this is the anterior view and this here is the posterior view. And of course, we can easily tell those two apart because right here, and I'll make it smaller so that it fits, we have the spine of the scapula, and that doesn't need to be uh, the scapula right there. And so it allows us to kind of orient ourselves pretty well as we are working our way through this. So if I remember correctly, while I don't need to know the origins and the insertions, I do recall that there is an indentation in the bone of the scapula up here above the spine. And what was this indentation above the spine on the posterior part of the scapula called again? I'll wait. Close, it wasn't suprascapular, it was above the spine, so it was supra... Yeah, supraspinous fossa, but you absolutely have the right idea. Guess what muscle sits here in the supraspinous fossa? supraspinatus. So this muscle that is here above the spine of the scapula in the supraspinous fossa is the supraspinatus. There is a muscle, and let's change colors, then that is located down here like this. And that pink looks pretty much like the purple. So I don't like that. Let's undo all of that. And change it to orange. See if that shows up a little better. There we go. Excellent. That muscle right there is in the indentation below the spine. What is the indentation below the spine called? Infraspinatus? Right, well, it's the infraspinous fossa. So the muscle that is in the infraspinous fossa, you are absolutely correct, is the infraspinatus. See how convenient that is? Notice over here on the anterior side, which remember we said was underneath the scapula when it is oriented properly in the body, 
was a big, large, indented region. And what did we call this big, large, indented region on the underside of the scapula? The subscapular fossa, excellent. So guess what we call the muscle that sits in the subscapular fossa? And you should have your lists of muscles in front of you. This should be easier. Subscapularis, excellent. All right, perfect. Three muscles, three indentations, three fossas, and three muscles inside of them. That is spectacular. Now, let's do one more. I'll use white for this one. Notice right here is a large round shaped muscle. We see it a little bit here from the front. We see it a little bit here from the back. Anyone have any idea what that muscle might be? Again, you have a list of muscles in front of you that might help. Any idea what this white muscle might be? Is it Terry's minor? Close, it is the teres major. Now, is the teres major one of the muscles that is on your list? No. So do you care about it? Shouldn't. Shouldn't, exactly. Except the one advantage of knowing that we have this large teres minor, I mean, pardon me, the large teres major, is where you have a major you typically have a minor. Where you have a longus, you have a brevis, and so on and so forth. When they use these types of adjectives, that usually tells you something about it. And so if there is a teres major, even though you don't have to know it, it helps us to realize that right next to it, basically between the teres major and the infraspinatus, this small muscle right here in yellow, is indeed, as was pointed out, this is the one that is the teres minor. So notice there are these four muscles all associated with the uh, scapula, all on the scapula, but notice they all connect to the head of the humerus. In fact, if we change our highlighter to black, we can see how the supraspinatus comes out onto the head of the humerus with its tendon there. The uh, infraspinatus comes out with its tendon out here around the head of the humerus. The teres minor comes out onto the head of the humerus and the subscapularis. Uh, All of these come out and come around the head of the humerus. In fact, these four muscles are the only four muscles whose tendons wrap around the head of the humerus. Their job is to help to hold the head of the humerus in place. So from the top, from the back, from the front, they all come and wrap around forming a supportive structure, one could even say a supportive cuff around the head of the humerus holding this in place. And so these four muscles together, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the subscapularis, and the teres minor collectively form a muscle group that supports the head of the humerus. And what do we call this muscle group that supports the head of the humerus? The rotator cuff, exactly. This is the rotator cuff. You hear about quarterbacks, you hear about pitchers, people who are putting a, a tremendous amount of force on that shoulder joint, often hear about them tearing the rotator cuff or, 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 or straining the rotator cuff. That's typically the uh, damage or stretch of one of these tendons of these four muscles that attach and hold the head of the humerus in place. So like I said, while you don't need to know their origins and insertions, do knowing the facets of the scapula help you to identify the muscles? Absolutely. And uh, they help to, they're the only ones that connect to the head of the, hu uh, the, of the humerus. 
So even though you don't need to know their insertions, knowing that helps you to know that they form that supportive cuff around them. And then that can help us to understand their actions. All right, so let's talk about the actions of each of these. Starting first with the supraspinatus. Supraspinatus, as you can see here on the model, or maybe now it might be easier to go back to the picture from the textbook. The supraspinatus, as you can see, comes right over the top of the humerus, basically right straight down. Because it comes straight from the top, it's above it, it's not gonna really be able to swing the arm forward or backward or rotate it or anything like that. Basically, it just forms a lateral mo uh, uh, a muscle. And that lateral muscle, as we talked about, basically just has one action. What is the one action of the supraspinatus? abduct the arm. However, what's interesting about this one, if you look at it, because of its angle, it's only good for abducting about 15 to 20 degrees. After that, it's going to be the deltoid that is able to abduct it the rest of the way. So someone used the example in the last class of talking about the chicken dance, right, for the deltoid. This is really the one that allows you to do the chicken dance, because if you think of the chicken dance, chicken dance is only letting you bring the arms up about 10 or 15 degrees as you're doing that chicken dance at the wedding. So this really is the chicken dance muscle, the one that only AB ducks the arm just about 15 to 20 degrees. All right. So that is the supraspinatus. Let's go back to the front view to the subscapularis. Notice this one basically is coming right off the scapula to wrap around the head of the humerus. It's pretty high and pretty straight across. So it's really not able to flex or extend the arm, but really all it can do is basically pull on the head of the humerus, because after all that's its job is to support the humerus and pull it inward. So how many actions does our subscapularis have? One. And what is that one? Rotating. Right, that medial rotation. Excellent, that medial rotation. Perfect. Group one, what'd you come up with for where you would medially rotate the arm like that? Yeah, there, group one. Anyone from group one here? So I think the person who was responsible for this is not in the class anymore. Okay. So let me just. Although I would argue we're all responsible for all yes. this information, yeah. right? Um, so is it medially rotating the, here, I'll show you. Is it medially rotating like the shoulder or like yeah, the arm? Just the humor. So I, we're exag, you and I are exaggerating when we're doing this because we're really pulling the scapula forward as well. Really mm -hmm. all it does, again, if you think of the longitudinal axis of the humerus, it turns it inward. So it basically rotates it inward. Maybe we were like doing a dance like that. Sure, maybe a TikTok dance or something like that. I always think of it, if someone's going to punch in the arm, you always kind of flinch a little bit. Or if you're going to get a shot or something like that, you kind of flinch a little bit. Okay. It's really just that okay. turning inward of the arm that way. All okay. right. Excellent. All right. So those two, the supraspinatus and the subcapillaris, are pretty linear in their relationship. And so not surprisingly, they only have uh, one action each. Notice when we look at the infraspinatus, the infraspinatus is a broad muscle. And again, let's emphasize this by highlighting this muscle because I think it can sometimes be a little confusing. These fascicles, this, these here and all of these here, that is the infraspinatus. Remember, it is not the tiny muscle here. This tiny muscle here is the teres minor. And notice across the gap, the more obvious muscle is the teres major. So I keep pointing out the teres major, uh, not because it's on the list and you have to know it, but if you can find the teres major, which is often easier to find, then you know the teres minor is right across from it. So just this one tiny band is the teres minor minor, it's small, whereas this big large structure here is the infraspinatus. And notice because the infraspinatus feels most of the infraspinous fossa, 
it is more angled in its action on the humerus. It's posterior on the shoulder. So the same way that the subscapularis can medially rotate the arm, the infraspinatus can laterally rotate the arm. But because it is a little inferior, it's more at an angle, so it's also able to extend the arm. So it extends the arm and laterally rotates the arm. Group two, what do you have for this one? Ariel, are you going or am I going? <laughs> um, I'll go. Okay. okay. So I had just when you're in anim an anatomical position. Okay. Um, laterally. Okay, excellent. So uh, you definitely, you definitely are extending the arms when you're doing that. So that's definitely true. And yeah, you're supinating the arm, but you probably are also laterally rotating it as well. Uh, the only thing I would say is, is there are some things you can do to exaggerate that effect a little bit more. Remember, one of the things we talked about is if you bend your elbow, you can see the rotations a little bit easier. Because again, remember, we're thinking about what happens here with the humerus. So as I turn it this way, that's a medial rotation. So as I turn my hand outward, as I rotate my hand outward, that is a lateral rotation. So think about it. Bring your hands back, laterally rotate them. Just so when you're doing those jazz hands, you are extended and you are laterally rotated. So that's the one I always think for this one. All right, excellent. But definitely you're right. I think when you go into anatomical position, the 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 uh, the you 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 you're, uh, you tend to uh, laterally rotate the humerus when you're coming out like that as well. So I do mm -hmm. like that a lot. All right. Notice that leaves us with the teres minor. Ironically, the teres minor is the smallest of all the muscles, but because it is the most inferior and most angled, it actually has three actions. What are the three actions of the teres minor? Laterally rotate, extend, and adduct the arm. There you go, exactly. So again, same thing. We're adducting, we're laterally rotating, but it also can extend it back. All right? So again, I always think of this in terms of like a tennis. If you're going to take that forehand in tennis, right, you always have to keep the elbow in. So you keep the elbow in, you're adducting the arm, laterally rotating, and extending it back so that you can do that action of the terrace minor. All right? Questions on those? All right, excellent. With that then, let us move from the uh, shoulder down to the forearm. All right. Now, as I mentioned, and I wanna go through this a couple of times. So actually, let's do this. I haven't actually looked at it yet, but let's, let me do something here. Let's stop this. Oops, wrong, that's where I'm gonna have that wrong thing. That was bones, I want that. All right, perfect, this is what I want. Oops, I'm sorry, push the right button. So, here is one of the illustrations from Kasumnis River College's virtual anatomy lab. And what I want to do first, without all the labels, without everything else, I want to take a minute to look at and walk through the muscles of the arm to try to make some sense of them. Now, as I mentioned, one of the things you need to do first is you need to get a good solid starting point. And notice the easiest way to get that starting point is to start at the thumb and follow that thumb back. And there we have that brachioradialis. So this muscle here is the brachioradialis. 
right? This brachioradialis is uh, the big prominent lateral muscle. That's that bodybuilder muscle that we were talking about using as you set up that one. From there, we can go both onto the posterior side of the arm and we can go onto the anterior side of the arm. So we can follow this three, but two ways, to the back or to the front. Since we're looking at the front view, we'll start here. Notice also, as we look at this, and let's emphasize this in purple, there is one, two, three tendons, three prominent tendons that we can actually see on the, in the wrist region of our forearm. In fact, this is something you can actually do for yourself as well, right? Take off my wrist, because I think it's a little more prominent on my right arm. What you can do is, with your arm, I don't know if I've got enough light to be able to show this, but what you can do if you flex your wrist one, two, three. So you can see those three tendons that are sticking out on the surface of your wrist. Those three prominent tendons, right, as you flex your wrist that can stand out. And those three prominent tendons, we can see nicely on the model. So as we switch back to the model, those tendons tell us everything we want to know. Remember, as I mentioned, the way you are going to easily identify the muscles of the arm is you're responsible for the superficial ones. Find the bellies, but what really tells you about the muscle are the tendons. Now, notice this first tendon, and we'll highlight it now. Well, let's go back, yellow again. So this muscle right here in yellow, was our brachial radialis. So what we're gonna do here is now go to this muscle right here. There isn't anything special about the muscle itself, but if we follow its tendon, we send, see its tendon goes to the thumb side of the wrist, okay? So we have a muscle that comes to the thumb side. Remember, we have two bones in the forearm, one on the thumb side, one on the pinky side. What was the bone on the thumb side again? The radius. Radius, excellent. It also is crossing the wrist bones. Now, while we needed to know all eight of the wrist bones, what were they collectively known as again? Carpals. The carpals. And this is an anterior muscle. Being an anterior muscle, what kind of actions do we say anterior muscles typically did? Extension. Well, do they extend? Just kidding. They flex. they flex. There you go. Exactly. So notice if you put all of that together, what we have is the flexor carpi radialis. This is the anterior muscle that crosses the wrist on the thumb side. So it is the flexor carpi radialis. Notice opposite of that and let's use orange for this one. We have a belly, whoops, no, no, that's not orange. We have a belly, we're notice the belly of it we can barely see, because the belly of it is actually more on the posterior side of the arm. Oops, gosh, hold on. That should be purple, I don't wanna get confusing. Flexor, carpi, radialis. And so we can erase that one. Excellent. So now I go back to my highlighter. And when I'm on my highlighter, what you will notice is that as you can feel, as you can see on your wrist, there is this bump that sticks out. Anyone remember what the bump on the pinky side of our arm is again? What would that bump be that you can all feel? Anyone know what that bump is? Cumulative class. That is, well, actually, it's the styloid process of the ulna, right? So it is the, so you're right, it's the head, but then coming off the head is the styloid process. So that is the head and styloid process of the ulna. I'd accept head, that's a good one. It's a prominent bone that you can actually feel. So a tendon that comes in front of that head of the ulna is going to flex, and a tendon that goes behind it is going to extend the wrist. 
even though the belly of this muscle appears to be on the back side, you'll notice its tendon comes in front of that head of the ulna. And because it comes in front of the head of the ulna, we consider it an anterior muscle, which means it is going to flex, so it is a flexor. It is crossing the wrist, so it is a carpi. But this one is on the pinky side, and so since this one's on the pinky side, it's the flexor carpe ulnaris. ulnaris. Excellent. So notice we basically have muscles. The muscles themselves may not be parallel, but notice the tendons are. One tendon crosses the wrist on the thumb side, one tendon crosses the wrist on the pinky side. Both cross in the front, so both are flexor carpe muscles. One is an ulnaris, one is a radialis. So we have a flexor carpe radialis and a flexor carpe ulnaris. And notice, there is a third tendon in between. If we look at that third tendon in between, and we'll use green for this one, this is a very small muscle, but a really long tendon that goes all the way right towards the palm of the hand. So what do you think we call this muscle in the middle with a long tendon that goes all the way to the palm of the hand? Palmaris longus. There you go. Palmaris longus. There you go. And just that simply, we have identified the three forearm muscles that uh, for three anterior forearm muscles that you are responsible for. Notice the easiest way to figure out what they are is to look at their tendons and see where their tendons go. Their tendons tell us everything about them. All right. Questions on that? All right, I want to talk about two more things while we are here. Notice I was able to get those three tendons to stand out pretty prominently. You may not necessarily have been able to get all of them to stand out pretty prominently, but what hopefully you were, well not hopefully, what likely you were able to do was to get at least one of them to stand out. The reason for that is if you look closely, here in the wrist region is a structure. And this structure stabilizes most of the tendons in of the wrist and hand. Any idea what we might call this structure that stabilizes most of the tendons of the hand and wrist? If only I had a list of structures that I was responsible for and I could figure out which one might be on the front. Perfect, the flexor retiniculum. Excellent, all right? that flexor retiniculum. However, if you look closely, what you see is that the tendon of the palmaris longus doesn't actually, oops, hold on. The tendon of the palmaris longus doesn't actually go under the flexor retiniculum, it goes over it. So most people can usually get at least one big tendon to stick out. And that one big tendon most people can get to stick out is the flexor retiniculum. Notice I keep saying most, because there are some people who don't have a flexor reticulum, I mean, apartment, who don't have a palmaris longus. In fact, probably about 15, 20% of the population, especially in their left arm, don't have a palmaris longus. If you're right-handed, uh, then there's like a 20% chance you don't have a palmaris longus in your left arm. It just fused together with other muscles and isn't a distinct muscle on its own. So you might not have that prominent tendon on your left, but you might on your right, or you may have both. All right. Questions on that? Is that based on your you using that muscle or how does that no happen? it's just it was something that happened morphologically as we were born and growing up so as you were born so it's more of a genetic thing 
as opposed to use dependent. And more importantly, not having it doesn't affect your, you know, it's not like you're more dexterous if you have that muscle than not. That muscle has just been incorporated into other things. So there's other muscles that do the thing that the palmaris longus would have done. But that does bring us to the last thing we have to talk about for these three muscles, what their actions are. Now, all of these cross the wrist and all of them are anterior muscles. So of course, what is the obvious action that all of them are going to have? Flex. Flexing the wrist, absolutely. And again, notice I, my hand is not in anatomical position, but that is still considered a flex, right? If I wanna walk like an Egyptian, I am still flexing the wrist. So we always assume anatomical position. So even if I'm like this, even if I'm like this, even if I'm like this, that is still a flex because when I was in anatomical position, that would be coming up that way. So this is a flex no matter what way you point your arm, okay? So all of them are gonna flex. Notice the flex, uh, flexor carpe radialis is on the thumb side. So when it contracts, not only can it bring the hand forward, but it can also tilt the hand to the thumb side. And what type of action would that be? Be careful, we always assume anatomical position. So if I'm in an anatomical position, and when I'm in anatomical position, I do that with the hand. What type of action was that? Abduction. An abduction, where I brought it away from the body. Whereas if I contract the ulnaris, it's gonna bring the hand towards the body. And what type of action would that be? A deduction. There you go. So notice radialises are going to abduct, uh, ulnarises are going to adduct the hand. And the palmaris longus is right in the middle, so is it going to adduct or, or abduct? No, it doesn't either. It just flexes the hand. So flexor carpi radialis flexes and adducts, abducts, uh, flexor carpi ulnaris flexes and adducts. So again, we can come up with the simple mnemonics, but if you remember those, flexors flex, ulnarises are going to adduct, and radialises are going to abduct. It is an easy way to distinguish them. All right. Questions on that? So like I said, I know the forearm can be scary and intimidating, but if you saw, we were able to identify these muscles pretty quickly and because of their names, it really tells us everything about them, what they do. All right, so let's switch and look at the back of the hand, back of the arm. Now oh, that's deep, we don't care about that. All right, let's go back to this view. There we go, perfect. All righty, oh, get rid of that. Again, we need a solid starting point. That solid starting point, we find the thumb, we follow it straight back, and this muscle right here, right on top, right on the lateral, once again, that muscle right there is going to be the brachioradialis. Oops, there we go. Again, Technically, it's not considered a forearm muscle because remember, it doesn't affect the wrist, it doesn't affect the hand, but remember, I also told you it was going to be an important anchor to be able to recognize all the other muscles we needed. It helped us to find the muscles on the anterior side of the arm. It's going to help us find the muscles on the posterior side of the arm as well. No, I still need that to be red. There you go. All right. So we comfortable with our starting point. Because if you can't find the starting point, then it's just going to get worse from there. All righty. So notice right next to the starting point is this muscle right here. Notice once again, it is a muscle with a very short belly and a very long tendon that comes to the back of the hand on the thumb side. Now, it's a posterior muscle, so what does that tell us about it? Is it a flexor or an extensor? 
extensor. It is an extensor. Crosses the wrist, so it is a, an extensor carpi. It's on the thumb side. What does that tell us? Radialis. There you go, radialis. However, notice this one had a very small belly and a really long tendon. And what do we sometimes call muscles that have really long tendons? The longest. So here we have the longest name of the longest named muscle of our forearm. But its name tells you everything about it. The extensor carpi radialis longus extends the wrist, meaning it's on the posterior side, crosses the wrist on the thumb side. And it has a very short belly and a really long tendon. All right. With me so far? Yes. Now, remember I told you something else. If you have a longest something, then you typically are going to have a brevis something. If you have a maximus, you're going to have a minimus. This muscle right here, right next to the extensor carpi radialis longus, is the extensor carpi radialis brevis. However, do you care? No. No. Why not? Not on the list. Not on the list. But it is a landmark that helps us to get to the next muscle. And as we get to the next muscle, I'll use green for this one. Again, notice there isn't necessarily anything unique or particular about the muscle itself. It's definitely not a short muscle, so we know it's not going to have a long tendon. But again, we follow the tendons. And if you notice what happens to this tendon is this tendon actually branches to go to digits two, three, and four. This tendon actually branches to go to the digits of your hand. So we have this muscle on the back of our arm that is going to branch and go to multiple digits. Well, what might we want to call a muscle that branches to go to multiple digits on the back side of our hand? Extensor digitorium. There you go, our extensor digitorum. Excellent. Notice it doesn't go to the thumb, but we already know the thumb has that saddle joint that makes it pretty darn special. But notice it also doesn't go to the pinky. Notice, and I'll use my highlighter for, I mean my pointer for this rather than this. There is this muscle right here that actually does go to the pinky that lets you extend the pinky. This is something that's really important if you're Dr. Evil because you want a million dollars. And of course, if you're Dr. Evil, you have a mini me. And lo and behold, this is the extensor digitorum minimus, the mini-me, right? All of that is really fun and, and, and enjoyable and fun to say and good to mimic, but once again, do we care? No, because it's not on your list. So the minimus we don't care about as well, but it's a landmark that we need to hop over to get to these next two muscles. For these next two muscles, I'll use brown for one of them. Here is the belly of one. Whoops, a little too much. Here is the belly of one. Notice also in yellow, there is a second belly right here that we can kind of see from the backside. But notice if we follow them, notice that our tendon of the yellow muscle goes in front of the ulnar head. 
this tendon that goes in front of the ulnar head means that we consider it an anterior muscle. And notice that's the muscle we already identified. This yellow muscle is the flexor, carpi ulnaris. However, notice our brown muscle, which belly is right next to it, but its tendon goes behind the head of the ulna. And because its tendon goes posterior to the head of the ulna, it is considered a posterior muscle that is going to be able to therefore extend the hand on the pinky side. So based on that, what do you think we call this brown muscle that I've drawn? If the yellow one is the flexor carpe ulnaris, what does that make this brown one? Extensor carpe ulnaris, excellent. Both are on the pinky side. One comes in front of the head of the ulna, so it flexes the hand. One comes behind the head of the ulna, so it extends it. So the one on the back is the extensor carpe ulnaris. The one on the front is the flexor carpe ulnaris. So one extends the hand, one flexes the hand. Both are on the pinky side, so both are going to adduct the hand. But there they are side by side, and really the only difference is where their tendons go. And just that easily, we have now identified the three muscles we need to identify on the back of the hand. The extensor carpe radialis longus, the extensor digitorum, and the extensor carpe ulnaris. So notice, if you find that brachial radialis as a starting point, if you follow the tendons, it tells you exactly where the muscle goes, and it also tells you exactly what the muscle does. Questions on that? All right, I've gone through it on the model. Let's go through it with all the pretty pictures from your textbook, but we'll do it the exact same way. However, what we're gonna do this time is we're gonna work our way around the posterior side first. So remember, as I started, we need a starting point. That starting point is this muscle on the thumb side. And this muscle here, I'm going to use my highlighter for this. Muscle on the thumb side is the brachioradialis. Right next to it is a short bellied muscle with a long tendon that goes to the thumb side. So this muscle right here is the, break, uh, the, the extensor carpe radialis longus. Right next to that is the extensor carpi radialis brevis that we don't care about, but it's a landmark which we can hop over to get to the extensor digitorum, this muscle whose tendons clearly branch to go to the three digits of the hand. Of course, not to the pinky. That is what the extensor digitorum minimus does, the mini-me does. But it brings us right here to this muscle that goes behind the uh, pinky, behind the head of the ulna, and that is the extensor carpe ulnaris. Notice we can still see the belly of the flexor carpe ulnaris because its belly starts on the posterior side, but remember its tendon goes to the front. And because its tendon goes to the front, we still consider it an anterior muscle. So as we find that head of the ulna, that's a good landmark. We've made it halfway around the arm, and now we're at that flexor carpi ulnaris that we're going to see there as well. Notice also on the posterior side of the arm, and we see it here. I forgot to show you on the model, so let's look at it at the model as well. There we go. I like this in purple. We have this structure that is a strap of connective tissue that stabilizes the tendons of the wrist in place on the posterior side. 
and of course what would we call this uh, strap of connective tissue, the structure on the posterior part of the arm. What is this? If only I had a list of the structures I was responsible for. Flexor retinaculum. Well, remember, the one in the front would be the flexor retiniculum. So the one on the back would be the oh, extensor. extensor retiniculum. Excellent. So there is the extensor retiniculum. And that's what our picture from the textbook shows as well. From that flexor carpial nerus, we flip it over to the back side, uh, I mean, to the front side. Notice again, we don't see much of the belly, but what we do see is its tendon, and its tendon comes in front of the head of the ulna. There's the head of the ulna, so it's coming in front of that. So that makes it our flexor carpe ulnaris. Right next to that, we have a small bellied muscle with a long tendon that goes in front of the flexor retiniculum, right to the palm of the hand. That is our palmaris longus. Right next to that, we have a muscle whose tendon goes to the front of the hand on the thumb side, flexor carpi radialis. And right from there, we hop across to the brachioradialis and we're right back where we started. Three muscles on the anterior side, three muscles on the posterior side. Find that brachioradialis as your starting point, follow the tendons and it will be easy to differentiate all of these muscles. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Just that easily then, we are now done with the muscles of the forearm. Oh, and then again, here we have that nice flexor retiniculum, which we can see on the anterior side, which again stabilizes most of the tendons, but not the tendon of the palmaris longus. So that's the one that tends to stand out most prominently. All right, there you go. Again, it can be intimidating when you first look at this because you see a lot of names, you see a lot of muscles, but remember, we are just looking at the superficial muscles, uh, and if you pay attention to the tendons, the tendons will tell you where they go. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. Then let's move on to the leg starting with everybody's favorite muscle, the gluteus maximus, right? This is the one that can apparently make you famous, right? <clears throat> that and having a father who's a lawyer, uh, those are the things that can make you famous. We think of the gluteus maximus as a posterior muscle. After all, it forms your posterior. But when you look, especially as you look at the orientation of the fascicles, you can see it is a posterior and a medial muscle. Where we really see that is when we look at the origins and the insertions. So let's draw the origins and the insertions for the gluteus maximus. Excellent. All right, so let's see, I need my drawing point. I need to make it red and I need to increase the width. Excellent. So what is the origin of the gluteus maximus? Sacrum, excellent. So it goes along the edge of the sacrum. What else? And the coccyx. And notice the dorsal ilium. Not all the way out quite to the crest, but just the dorsal part of the ilium here. So notice we have a very medial um, origin for this. What is its insertion? What is the insertion of the, again, you guys should have the list in front of you. This should not be hard. Excellent, the gluteal tuberosity. Notice the gluteal tuberosity is this kind of V-shape, uh, rough and stuff. Remember at the top of the linea alba, so the line, uh, pardon me, linea spare. Linea spare goes up and then kind of enlarges into, there you go, exactly, into that gluteal 
uh, tuberosity. So notice the fascicles of that are going to insert into this. However, if we go back to the picture, especially if we make it a little bit bigger, notice that while we can see how some of it is indeed inserting into the back part of the femur, notice most of the fascicles are actually inserting into this big, huge white band of connective tissue that goes all the way up here from the ilium all the way down below the knee onto the tibia. Any idea what we might call this band of connective tissue that goes all the way from the ilium all the way down to the tibia? Yeah, there you go. How about the iliotibial band or the iliotibial tract? This iliotibial band plays an important role in helping to stabilize the muscles of the leg and stabilizing the knee. Uh, again, distance runners like my wife often, or, or soccer players, I know some of you talked about playing soccer or knowing soccer players. Uh, when you use your legs a lot and they get inflamed, one of the things that happens as you inflame those is they can put pressure on this iliotibial band, which is a problem. Muscle is more dynamic and muscle is able to expand, but the collagen fibers of this iliotibial band aren't able to expand in the same way. And so what can happen is you can actually get uh, displacement of the knee or pain to the knee or to the hip as a result of this, right? So there's all sorts of IT band uh, stretches or rolling and things like that to loosen that IT band up for those people that have IT band problems, problems with their IT band. So that's from that structure. What's interesting about the iliotibial band, and I'm gonna cheat and jump ahead a couple pictures. Uh, not this one, this is the one I want. All right, perfect. So notice what's going on here. Here over here, we have a portion of the iliotibial band that is coming up here from the ilium and coming down along the side. However, if you notice, the iliotibial band is really thickened portion of this connective tissue structure that wraps around the entire leg. Has anybody been hospitalized, put in a hospital bed for a prolonged period of time, or known someone who's been put in a hospital bed for a prolonged period of time? One of the things that happens if you're stuck in a hospital bed for a long period of time is they will put these inflatable pillows basically around your legs, these inflatable cuffs. And what they do is every once in a while, they will inflate with air to squeeze your legs and then they relax again. Why do they do those? Why do they put those cuffs on your leg? Right, part of it is to prevent blood clots. What else, why doesn't it, how does it help to prevent blood, blood clots? Maybe reduce atrophy a little bit, but that's more when you're stimulating the muscles, like if someone was in a, uh, is in a coma or something like that. It isn't so much stimulating the muscles, but it is squeezing the muscles to increase circulation. One of the things that we do every day, again, your blood in your legs has to fight gravity to get back to your heart. So as you're standing there at anatomical wait, uh, position waiting for the bus, it's a lot harder for the blood from your legs to get back to your heart than it is from the blood from your arms or the blood from your head. So one of the ways we help the blood in our legs get back to our heart is by contracting the muscles. As you walk, right, you, uh, it helps to stimulate the squeezing the muscles, changing the shape of the muscles, squeezes the blood vessels, and helps to send the blood back. That's why if you're waiting tables for eight hours and constantly running around, you get swelling at the end of the day. But how about that guy we talked about who is taking tolls in the toll booth where he's standing in a box for eight straight hours? Is he getting a lot of leg mo movement? No, and his legs and his feet are really swelling by the end of that day. So that muscle contraction helps to move blood back. The other thing that helps is we have this connective tissue cuff that is called the fascia lata. This fascia lata basically wraps around the thigh region. It stabilizes the muscles of the leg, and by squeezing, by putting tension in this cuff, we can squeeze the muscles of the leg to help to push the blood back up. Now, if you're gonna have a cuff that works that way, you need a starting point, you need a starting structure, and that's what the iliotibial tract is. This fiber is a thickened part of the fascia lata. And conveniently enough, there is a muscle 
the tensor fascia latia that puts tension in the fascia lata, squeezes the fascia lata, connects to the iliotibial band and forms that pressure cuff that helps to prevent blood clots, helps to increase circulation and helps to stabilize the muscles of the leg. So here we have this connective tissue structure that is supporting these and the structure of the iliotibial band on the outer surface. And if we go back to our original picture, we can see that yes, the gluteus maximus inserts into the iliotibial, I'm pardon me, into the gluteal tuberosity. But as we see, it's made up of a bunch of parallel fascicles. And those parallel fascicles basically all run parallel to each other. And so they insert both into the uh, deltoid tu uh, gluteal tuberosity, but also they insert into the iliotibial band. Notice also that orientation helps us to understand its actions, plural. How many actions, plural, does the gluteus maximus have? Two, being a posterior muscle, Right, well, let's go back to the drawing. Oh, even though we erased it, cheat and draw it back real fast. So again, here is the origin. Here is the insertion, gluteal tuberosity and the iliotibial band. So we'll kind of put a little bit out here as well. And then those fascicles that are all running parallel here. How many joints does it cross? Just one, the hip. Being a posterior muscle, what effect does it have on the hip? Extending the hip, excellent. And because it attaches to the femur on the back side, it is able to rotate the femur rotate the femur so that the anterior part moves away from the midline. So that of course is a lateral rotation. Excellent. So group six, what do you have for an action of the gluteus maximus? What activity did you come up with to help us to remember that it extends and laterally rotates the thigh or the hip? Um, so for this one, um, for this one, I did standing. Okay. Like, if you're standing in an anatomical position, well, you can't really see my hips, but um, I don't know. You like extend your legs, and then your feet are kind of pointed out a little bit. True, but well, but remember, in anatomical position, though, your feet should be pointing forward, right? So if you yeah. are going to laterally, if you're going to, I don't know if you can see my feet. If we do this, if you are going to laterally rotate the leg, what happens to your foot? It's pointed to the side. All right. So that would be more, what, right? In ballet, what position is this? First position. Something like that, right? First or second position? I don't know. I can never remember. But there you go. Right? Kids took ballet when they were little. So extending it and bringing, oh, I like the penguin walk. That'd be a good example as well, where, you're, where you have to laterally rotate the feet out to be able to do that penguin walk. There you go. So if you're trying out for a penguin and Mary Poppins, Poppins, right, the play, you have to do that penguin walk. You need to have a strong gluteus maximus to be able to do that. All right. Questions on that? All right. So. Once again, as we mentioned, if you have a maximus of something, you are gonna have a minimus of something. In this case, we don't care about the minimus, but we also have a third, and that is the gluteus medius in between. Notice when we look at the illustration, the gluteus medius appears to be just deep to the gluteus maximus. However, if we look closely or more importantly, if we look at the origin and insertion of the gluteus medius, you'll see there's another big difference between them. As I keep mentioning, your gluteus maximus is a posterior muscle, right? It is your posterior. Your gluteus medius is really a lateral muscle. And we see this particularly when we look at its origin and its insertion. So let's do that. Let's look at the origin and the insertion of the gluteus medius. 
what is the origin of the gluteus medius? Lateral surface of the ilium. There you go, exactly. Notice it doesn't go up onto the crest. It is under the crest, but there is this lateral kind of fossa that is here on our ilium and this region here on the lateral aspect of the ilium. Not all the way up to the crest, not all the way out to the spines, but just this kind of indented region there on the lateral aspect of the ilium is the lateral origin of the gluteus medius. And being a lateral muscle, not surprisingly, it inserts into the lateral most bone feature of the uh, hip. And what is that lateral most bone feature? As I'm sure you know from your 30 point skeletal review, what is the lateral most bone feature of the hip? In fact, even though it's not the right picture, we can clearly see it nicely here. There you go, out here. Uh, that lateral bone feature of the hip is the greater trochanter of the femur. So there it is. So we have this lateral origin, lateral insertion for a lateral muscle. And being a lateral muscle, what is the most obvious action of that muscle going to be? Absolutely, abduction. However, notice its angle is a little bit wonky. And because its angle is a little bit wonky, it does have another action. What is the other action of the gluteus medius? It abducts the hip, but it also medially rotates it. So it's going to medially rotate it as well. All right? Group five, what did you guys come up with? for the gluteus medius, where you abduct and medially rotate? Uh, I think this one for the kick. Okay, yeah, are you gonna demonstrate it? Uh, I know these demonstrations get more awkward as we go lower on the body, but I appreciate you guys taking the, the effort. See, I guess like kick like this. Yeah, absolutely. However, remember, when you're absolutely right, you wanna kick out to the side, but remember the other thing you need to do is you need to immediately, hold on, tilt that down so I don't have to get up quite as high. You also want to immediately rotate the leg as well. So as you immediately rotate, right, your heel is going to go down. I mean, your heel is going to go up as your foot goes down. So you want to make sure you get that medial rotation as well. Right. I always think of it again, carrying the groceries in from the house. As I'm carrying the groceries in from the house, right? My kids go running inside the house and do they bother holding the door open for dear old dad? No, of course not. So the door is swinging closed and of course you need to catch it because your hands are filled with groceries. So what do you do? You stick out your heel. So you stick your leg out to the side and put your heel out so you can kind of hook the door and open it up so that you can get inside. That's the kind of action we're talking about. Adducting and medially rotating the leg. All right. Questions on that? How are we on time? We are doing great, excellent. All right, so we have time for at least one more. So those are our first two, the gluteus maximus and the gluteus medius. A posterior muscle and a meter muscle. Oh, that's the other thing I wanna talk about, the gluteus medius. Gluteus medius is also a very important muscle for, from a clinical standpoint because it's an important injection site. When you are doing an intermuscular injection in an adult in particular, uh, but in general, when you're doing an intermuscular injection, there are three things you are looking for in a muscle when you are going to inject a medicine into it, a bolus of medicine into it. The first is it has to be a large enough muscle where it can accept the uh, bolus of medicine. But there are two other factors you want to look at. The first is the perfusion. How rapidly does blood circulate through that muscle? If, if the blood circulates through the muscle too quickly, the medicine will be de uh, disseminated to the body too rapidly. If blood flow is too slow, the medicine will congest in that area and will not be diffused to the body rapidly enough. But the third thing you need to worry about is you need to worry about innervation that you're not hitting a nerve when you are making that injection. In the movie, when someone gets the shot, right, because it's much, much funnier, everyone's always getting it into the gluteus maximus. 
because it's funnier that way in the movies. The problem is there is a large nerve, in fact, the largest nerve in the body, the sciatic nerve, as we talked about, comes out that greater sciatic notch and comes down the leg. So when you actually do an intramuscular injection into the gluteus maximus, there is an increased risk of hitting one of those large nerves. So instead, what a nurse typically will do is they will find the crest of your ilium, go about two inches down from that, and once they go about two inches down from that, that is where they will insert the injection. So typically it is into the gluteus medius, not the gluteus maximus, that lateral muscle where they'll do the injection. It has good diffusion rate, it has a large muscle mass, and there's no large nerves. So that is one of the two main muscles we do intermuscular injections in. What is the other large muscle that we do an injection in commonly? One is the gluteus medius, the other is the deltoid. There you go, exactly. Notice the two prominent lateral muscles. Lateral muscle of the shoulder, lateral muscle of the hip are the two most common muscles in adults where you do intramuscular injections. Now, when you're dealing with little kids, it's a little trickier because they have smaller muscle masses. So often they will go into the quadricep muscles or they can go into the gluteus maximus and, and then sometimes also into the shoulder as well. But in adults, it's usually gluteus medius or the deltoid. All right, excellent. All right, the last thing that I wanted to get through for today, and I think we're doing good, and again, last week was so brutal, and we have uh, less and less to cover. So I think actually we'll finish a little early today with this rather than pushing forward. Uh, not that we're close to being done, there's still a fair amount we need to talk about, is our next muscle group. This muscle group is the hamstrings. And it's been a little while since we've talked about a muscle group. Well, not really, because we just talked about the rotator cuff. But remind me again the rules on a muscle group. First is obviously two or more muscles. But what is the second criteria for a muscle group? They must be similar in their functions. Not identical, but similar in their functions. But what is the other criteria of a muscle group? See, this is going to make a good essay question to put on the exam, so I'm going to have to make sure to add this one. How do you define a muscle group? Right. Not only is this going to be one of the essay questions, but one that all of you get. Similar in functions, absolutely, two or more muscles, but there was another criteria. What was the other criteria? Same reason, region, true. All right, similar in their functions. That means they have to be similar in the region. They all must share at least oops, one attachment point. They must have a shared origin or a shared insertion. That is the other criteria. All right. And that's what we have here in a muscle group called the hamstring. Anyone know why this is called the hamstring? Anyone? Well, it turns out the anatomy of a pig is leg is somewhat similar to the anatomy of a human leg. Here, when we look at the posterior part of the leg, notice there is this diamond, uh, that brown doesn't show up good. Let's use the bright green. There is this diamond shaped region in the posterior part of the leg. This diamond-shaped region is actually what is known as the popliteal fossa. Because of course the back of the leg is of course the popliteal region. So this is the popliteal fossa. And it's diamond shape. It's diamond shape because basically it's made up by several muscles coming together around this attachment point. Notice down here, and I'll stick with green for right now, there are these two bellies 
right here of this muscle and this muscle right here, and since it's written here, I'll point it out, are the medial and lateral bellies of the gastrocnemius. So the medial belly and the lateral belly of the gastrocnemius, a two-bellied muscle. But there are three more muscles that form this diamond-shaped region. Up here on the medial aspect, we have two muscles, and those two muscles are the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus that are coming down here on this side. And on this side over here, laterally, we have the bicep femoris, specifically the long head and the short head. So the two heads and short head that are coming together to form the superior part. So this diamond-shaped region is formed by these four muscles. The two bellies of the gastrocnemius, the two bellies of the, semi -femor uh, the bicep femoris, and then the semimembranosus and semitendinosus. These four come together to form this popliteal fossa. The reason this is significant is, like I said, the uh, pig leg has a very similar anatomy and a very similar region. So when they are butchering a pig, one of the things they do is they cut off the leg and the thigh is basically cured, right, salted and dried for a long period of time to produce ham, right? Like I said, we could argue whether or not meat is murder, uh, but meat is definitely muscle. And when they hang that ham in the meat locker to be able to cure it to produce ham, they take a big, huge meat hook they stick it into this popliteal teal fossa into the muscles of the hamstring and they string the ham up so that it can cure in the meat locker. So the hamstring is the muscle where you string the ham up so that it can cure into ham. And so that is why it is called the hamstring. These three muscles. All right. Now, like I said, the muscles here get a little messy when we're looking at all of this. So I think, like I said, sometimes it is easier if we peel them all the way and we just look at the back of the leg. There are three muscles that make up the hamstring, semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and the bicep femoris. But as the name indicates, the bicep femoris is going to be one of those muscles where you're going to need to be specific. And of course, if I be specific, I mean be specific in both the names and the origins. So let's start there. Bicep femoris sounds a lot like bicep brachia, but as we're going to see, they don't actually share a lot of similar characteristics. The one characteristic they do share is that there is a long head and a short head. So we've identified the heads. Let's start first by identifying the origins. What is the origin of the long head? of the bicep femoris. Ischial tuberosity. There you go, your butt bone. Right down here, your butt bone is the ischial tuberosity, and this right here is indeed the origin of the long head. I know we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but what is the insertion of the bicep femoris? Common tendon into the head of the fibula and lateral condyle of the tibia. There you go. So notice it is going to come right in here into the head of the fibula and the lateral condyle. Notice it doesn't go in between the femur and the tibia. They would be pinched by the knee joint. We don't have that, but it is going to come to the outside. So notice if we were to draw this muscle, and let's draw it nice and narrow. Basically, it comes across the leg this way and across the leg this way and inserts there. So we have this nice muscle that starts on the ischial tuberosity and goes medially. And that right there, what we've done in black, is the long head of the bicep femoris. 
Now, I'm going to use pink just to help to differentiate it. What is the origin of the short head of the bicep femoris? The linea spera. Remember that raised ridge that is on the backside of the femur. Not the gluteal tuberosity where it enlarges, just that raised ridge. So notice, and I'll draw it here in green, it has the same insertion. So notice the short head comes from the linea spera and comes right down into that same insertion. So remember, while the bicep brachia, the two bellies sit side by side, notice on the back of the leg, they're on top of each other. The long head sits on top of the short head. You almost don't see the short head. In fact, if we go back to the picture and look closely, this particular picture really only shows the long head. So again, let's highlight the long head and I'll use the highlighter for this. This is the long head of the bicep femoris. And then here in yellow, this teeny little bit we see sticking out down here, that is the short head. That's all you see of the short head. Now, luckily we have other ways of seeing this than the picture in the textbook. So let's go back to our Cosumnes River College's virtual anatomy lab. And if we go to the limbs of the muscular system and we work our way down to the leg, there we go. Excellent. Here on the posterior side here, notice we see that long head of the bicep femoris. Again, here we see that long head of the bicep femoris. And notice again, just the teeniest bit of this muscle sneaking out from underneath here is the short head of the bicep femoris. When that long head is there, we don't really see it very well. Conveniently, oh, don't they have, hold on. Oh, this model doesn't do a good job of showing it. Interesting. All right, well, the picture from your textbook will, I mean, from your uh, pers uh, pra uh, practice anatomy lab. The nice thing about these models is this muscle comes off. And when this muscle comes off, what you see underneath here is that short head sitting down in here underneath. What I will try to do is I will try to find a good picture for this and post it for you on our Canvas site that shows that short head of the bicep femoris under a deep view for that. So I'll see if I can find a decent picture of that and share that with you uh, after class today. I'll try to find it and get, as soon as I get it up, I'll post it and we'll go over it again tomorrow. But the short head is basically right underneath the long head. So they're not sitting side by side and we really don't see it well superficially in the model. We have to peel the muscle away Maybe I have a picture from the textbook that shows that. Let's see this. Look at all that. Look at all that. Nope, I don't have one either. Interesting. All right. Then I don't have a good picture, so I will have one for you next time. All right. Now, since we're already here, let's actually go back to this because I think this also does a nice job of showing us, and I like this view a little bit better. A little bit better of showing us the other two muscles on the other side. The other two muscles on the other side are the semimembranosus and semitendinosus. The way I remember them is the semitendinosus is the muscle that is on top. Much the same way the long head sits on top of the short head for the bicep femoris, the semimembranosus and semitendinosus have the same orientation, where the semitendinosus is on top. And even though our model maker hasn't done as good of a job of showing this, the reason it is the semitendinosus is because basically it's half muscle and half tendon. So it is a very narrow muscle that is superficial on top. The semimembranosus is this broad muscle that is deeper to it. So we actually see some of it coming out medially and some of it coming out laterally, because basically you have that broad membranosus 
and the more narrow syndenosis sitting on top. So the semitendinosus is on top, the semimembranosus is broader, so it is more medial. And so we see that in the orientation here, and we also see that in the orientation here. So here, again, they've done a little bit of a better job of showing this. So again, we'll try to highlight it. This narrow muscle on top is the semitendinosus. And then this broader muscle underneath it that comes out more medially, right? But notice also comes out more laterally because it's wider underneath. This deeper muscle that is more wide underneath is the semimembranosus. So here's the good news. Identifying the two muscles are tricky. But once you've done that, when we go back here, what is the origin of the semimembranosus? Ischial tuberosity? Ischial tuberosity. What is the origin of the semitendinosus? Ischial tuberosity. So the semimembranosus and semitendinosus both have the same origin. In fact, they also have the same origin as the long head of the bicep femoris, and that's why this is a muscle group, because they all share that same origin. However, for a semimembranosus and semitendinosus, it gets even easier than that. What is the insertion of the semimembranosus? Underneath the medial condyle of the tibia. And what is the insertion of the semitendinosus? Medial condyle of the tibia. Notice they're both the same. So for our semitendinosus, and I'll draw it here in green, our semitendinosus is the muscle on top. It has this as its origin and its insertion. And the semimembranosus that is underneath it has the exact same origin and the exact same insertion. So these two muscles actually share both the origins and the insertions. So telling them apart is hard, but both their origins are the same, both their action, uh, pardon me, both their insertions are the same. And if their origins and their insertions are both the same, then guess what you can also say about their actions? Their actions are gonna be the same as well. So there you go. So finding them and telling them apart is the hard part. But origins, insertions, actions for the semimembranosus and semitendinosus are easy because they're the same. All right, questions on that? All right, so let me redraw. So here was my, oops, no, I don't want the straight line. I want the curved line. Here is, and again, I'm gonna exaggerate the size of this just to give us space. There is the long head of the bicep femoris. Here is the short head of the bicep femoris. And again, I'm exaggerating the size of those so that we can see them nicely. The last thing we need to do now is identify actions. How many joints does the bicep femoris cross? Crosses two joints, excellent. It crosses both the hip and the knee. So it is going to be able to affect both. It is a posterior muscle. So being a posterior muscle, what effect is that going to have on the hip? 
extend. Being a posterior muscle, what effect is that going to have on the knee? It is going to flex the knee, right? The knee is the one wonky joint where posterior muscles flex and anterior muscles are going to extend. So that is the one wonky part. Excellent. So those are two obvious actions. How many more actions does this muscle have? How many actions total does the bicep femoris have? Three. Excellent. So again, action one is to extend the hip. Action two is to flex the knee. And as was mentioned, the third action, because if you think about it, because of the way it is angled, when it pulls on the leg, it is going to rotate the leg this way. And since this is a posterior view, that means the anterior surface of the femur is going to turn outward. And so that third action is a lateral rotation of the leg. So brings the leg back, brings the knee back and laterally rotates the leg. Uh, group three. Did you come up with a good action to help us to know this one? I was thinking, um, I don't know how, I don't have that much space here, but I was thinking of one of the stretches I was doing back when we were doing things in person. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see, okay. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if you can. Okay, right, good to go. Yep. Okay, so it was basically you against the wall where you're. I can't bring my feet up all the way, but the idea is that your feet is is pressed against, um, not pressed against. Sorry, is using the stretching band and is pulling against um, the the band. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay, so again, obviously it's the leg, so it's a little bit trickier, but you've got the right idea. So can you guys see my leg? And you're, um, so again, the, the, that, that's a good one. I like that one because definitely it's one of those stretches that you're kind of doing. But again, what you got to remember is it is extending the hip. So it's bringing the hip down. It is flexing the knee. And then it is laterally rotating the leg. So the way I think of this is, again, notice as I do that, my foot goes behind my other foot. Uh, one of the, uh, you guys met Big, my oldest daughter. Uh, when she was a little kid, one of the things that, you, you know, she was very squirrely, would jump around a lot. So we'd always tell her, you know, when she wanted to come down, you have to sit crisscross applesauce. And the way she would do that, and I can't demonstrate this because I will kill myself if I do this. What she would do is she would actually take her leg and she would kick herself in the back of the knee. And if she kicked herself in the back of the knee, she would collapse down into that sitting cross-legged stance, right? So if you think about that, you extend the leg, you flex the knee, ouch. No, oh, I just put my water all over the place. Um, all right, hold on. I got to make sure none of this stuff is important. All right, here we go. Um, extend the hip, flex the knee, and then as you laterally rotate it, you would kick yourself in the back and go down into that crisscross applesauce position. So that is what she would used to do. So it's that. Yeah. So again, you you got to make sure you got that twist in it while you're doing that that lateral rotation. But that is the action of that. Notice that also is going to help us to understand the action. So thank you for that, Adina. We appreciate that. And you're group three, right? Correct. Perfect. Excellent. So four, four, four. Would it be the same? Because I know that um, other athletes would do the same, that they would use the same band just for different, you know, whoever has a different injury is using it for a different reason. So I feel like even with the band, you could do that, right? You can immediately rotate. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, again, the point is to put resistance in lots of different ways that you're doing these things. Absolutely. Yep. All right. So, because our muscle group has to be similar in their actions, you'll notice that again, both the semi tendinosis and the semi membranosis have the same actions. They also cross the same two joints. They also are going to have three actions. And it is also a posterior muscle. So, being a posterior muscle, Action one on the hip, what does a posterior muscle do to the hip? Extension. Extends. Excellent. 
What does a posterior muscle do to the knee? Flex. Flexes, excellent. And this one, notice, connects to the medial part. So when it pulls, it is going to pull the femur this way. And again, notice the point is partially pulling, but really these muscles are stabilizing the knee as well. This is all about stabilization of the knee and support of the knee. But while you're doing that, the anterior part of the femur is gonna to go towards the midline. So our third action is to medially rotate the leg. All right, so group four, what'd you guys come up with for this? Anyone there from group four? Still awake, still there? I'm sorry, which muscle are we doing it for? Uh, either the semi-membranosus or semi-tendinosus. You can pick whichever one, because because uh, their actions are the same, so the activity should be the same. Um, I think it's like, like climbing, like maybe to like climb up the stairs, like going up the stairs. Okay. Can you show us what you mean by that? Uh, yeah, give me one second. Me. Yep. Okay. Like, can you see the stairs? Like, going up the stairs. The okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I, I like your demonstration. However, the only problem that I would say with that, uh, and then obviously you're taking this class on a really odd location, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. the, you are definitely flexing the knee and you are likely immediately rotating it when you're doing that. But notice you have to flex the hip to bring it up to go up those stairs. Whereas for this, oh. we want to extend the hip. So I think you've got half of it right, but what we really wanna do is extend the hip, flex the knee, and then immediately rotate it. And notice as you immediately rotate it, the leg is gonna go out. So you know people use this often when they're doing hacky sack, or as I mentioned, I'm an older sibling. So as an older sibling, you're required by law to uh, to uh, torture your younger siblings. So, right, family reunion, everybody gets together for the family picture. You know, grandma's practically half dead, so she wants this picture of the family. It takes an hour and a half to get everybody lined up. Finally, three, two, one. And as you hit one, right, you whack your sister next to you, knock her over, she's out of balance, mess messes up the picture, grandma faints, mom's crying, all these things are going on because your sister ruined the picture. Right, and uh, again, because she's a horrible person, but you may have given her that little bit of encouragement and that to do that, you need to be able to extend your knee, uh, pardon me, extend your hip, flex your knee, and immediately rotate the leg. Oh. All right? Yeah. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Let me see where we're at. Well, again, I, look, my point of these examples isn't to look stupid, although that is a benefit for you that you get to enjoy me being stupid. But as I found with many mnemonics, right, the point of them is sometimes the stupid mnemonics are the ones that stick out. I mean, my, here's my favorite. I don't know if I shared this with you guys yet. Anyone know what that is? I mean, obviously it's a sad commentary on today's society. Anyone ha else have any idea what that is? No one? No one's never heard of it. Okay, excellent. Well, let me tell you a story then. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in eighth grade, there was a huge push in the United States for the United States to go metric. The entire rest of the world was metric. It was time for the United States to fall in line and be metric because everybody else. So what they decided is, you know what? Next Tuesday, the entire United States is going metric. So in eighth grade, we all had to learn the metric system. 
And way back in eighth grade, again, this tells you something about the, the, uh, the type of education that we received back east, but way back in eighth grade, this was the mnemonic that our teacher gave us to help us to remember the metric system. Because if you think of it in terms of length, you have kilometers, hecameters, decameters, meters, decimeters, centimeters, and millimeters. So this mnemonic helps you to keep and remember the order of the metric system. Now, of course, as we know, Tuesday came and went and the United States never went to the metric system and nobody ever talked about it again. But eighth grade for me is now 417 years ago and yet I still remember this stupid mnemonic. So yes, sometimes the silly, sometimes the stupid are the things that, yes, stand out. And that's the whole point of these. Or these, are things, if these are things that help you to remember and be successful on the exam, then I don't mind looking stupid to do it. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. With that then, that is as far as I had hoped to be able to get. And again, we still have talked past noon, so it's not like I'm letting you guys off early. But I think this is a good stopping point. I think we have enough time tomorrow to finish off the rest of the muscles, uh, to finish off the rest of the lecture, and be prepared for the exam on Thursday. So I think this is a good stopping point. Any questions before we call it a day? All righty, in that case then, you guys have a good day, study hard. I will see you tomorrow morning, eight o'clock. Have fun, be safe, study hard.